What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and welcome back for another episode of the Doug Polk Podcast. Today, we are joined by an iconic World Series of Poker voice. Norman Chad joins the podcast. We're going to talk about World Series of Poker. We're going to talk about maybe a little football, some sports betting as well. But before we do that, I want to let you guys know that we just had a podcast with Brian Mikon talking about NFTs, rare Pepe's. And then earlier this week, Nate Silver came on as well. Uh, Norman Chad's a big fan. Nate Silver, I'm sure he'll be the first to tell you. Also, uh, next week, nothing planned at the moment. Might be taking the week off, but the week after, Alexandra Botez, the chess player, will be joining the podcast. Should be a fun one, too. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our talks and conversations. On that note, let's bring him in. Norman Chad joins us today. Norman, how's it going, man? Always a pleasure to be with you, Doug. Always a pleasure uh, for the, I don't know, two times we've hung out. <laughs> Both great <laughs> pleasures. <laughs> now, before we get going here... Uh, Norman, Norm, I, I I know. Do people call you Norm or just Norman? Norman would be fine. Mr. Chad okay. is a little too formal. Norman's I'm, good. I wasn't going to call you Mr. Chad. Let's yeah. go with Norman. So, Norman, uh, you've been one of the most outspoken haters on the tank top train. And I wanted to make sure that my guests are comfortable. I want to make sure that they that they have a, a safe environment where they can speak their mind freely and say what, what they would enjoy saying and and feel feel not pressured and, and and maybe intimidated. So I threw on a little something something for you today. I want you to know the first guest that I've not had a tank top on for. You should feel special. I I actually you, you actually shocked me here. You threw me a curveball. You put me on tilt already. I how can you possibly outdress me? But by the way, if you have a mirror at home, and I'm sure you do, do you know how good you look? That's the way to go. You look like a professional. You look like an adult. And I thought you'd be wearing a tank top. I've seen your other ones, and you usually wear a tank top. I'm tired of seeing your arms. You, re you look really good, but you really threw me a curveball here, sir. Well, good. I'm getting you. I'm, I'm happy to throw you a curveball on this one. Okay. Now, I got some great topics for us here, uh, but we got to kick it off with this. Um, what number ex-wife are we currently on at the moment? Okay. I have – that's just not fair. Uh, I have two ex-wives. One, unfortunately, is what we call in baseball a cup of coffee. Uh, when you come up to the big leagues and then send you back down after two or three days. That was a very brief marriage. It was my mistake. I am currently with my third and hopefully uh, final wife. Next. Oh, man, we're, we're rattling through these. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> no, you can follow up on it. Yeah, I, I make up numbers on my wives just for entertainment purposes. Uh, I've been married twice before this current one, which is now in its 14th year. What's kind of the backstory that when, when did you first have the idea to to go down the ex wife joke rabbit hole? Because I feel that that's that's something you really took and made your own on on these World Series of Poker main event broadcasts. What was the inspiration for that? You know, besides the fact that I had I had when I was writing my newspaper column originally, I uh, about sports television. I used to like to try to incorporate my family and then uh, or my wife because we didn't have any kids. And then just incorporating my family, she left me while I was watching sports television a lot. So I incorporated it into my columns. And then I never, I obviously, I never gonna, thought I was going to be doing poker on television. But the, the 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 genesis of that is when I used to play blackjack in Las Vegas, particularly late night, like uh, heads up against the dealer, maybe one other person at the table. I would when when I would make jokes with them just to talk with them, and when they would beat me, you know, you know, if I'd have a nineteen and they have a twenty, and I go, you know, that's you know, the, the, you know, this that hand was worse than my first marriage. Uh, so th I would be making just references to them, always marital and divorce references when they were beating me at the blackjack table, and that's just somehow translated. I didn't know it was going to translate over to poker, but that's what happened. And I started making the references during poker. Did you, did you realize at that point it was going to be a smash hit? I assumed that people. I'm just imagining, right? Let's just say I'm 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 plastered. It's three a.m. I show up at the blackjack table. I guess that's my vision of how people play blackjack. And I roll in, and you're just berating the dealer and the table, and and making fun of your ex wives. I, I I'd probably enjoy that. Did did the did the, those crowds enjoy those jokes? Is that is that but, where you? Okay, if you know the dealer, you know dealers are different. I love. I used to play at the Mirage a lot when Steve Wynn still owned it, and the dealers there were terrific. And again, that that's that's a long job. You know, when you're dealing blackjack, you, you deal in you know you deal. Uh, you're one hour on, twenty minutes off all day long. One hour on, and you're standing. So, you know, they get smoke blown to their face. They get people who are upset because they're losing. You know, they can't tell them bring a new setup uh, like they do in poker. So they enjoy, again, late night. If they, if they have to deal, they certainly would like the camaraderie. So that's why I like talking with them. So, yeah, it was a hit with them. But anything, if you're talking with them, being friendly with them and tipping them, they're going to be in a better mood. It's just a really tough job. Absolutely. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people get upset at dealers. Like the dealer somehow controls their destiny and is, is, uh, I mean, I've seen that even, even in high stakes rooms, I've seen that where people just 
blame the dealer for stuff. And honestly, sometimes even when the dealer makes a mistake, so fucking what? They're human beings. Sometimes they make mistakes. Do you really need to have a tantrum about it? It, it really, it really bothers me when I see people treat dealers like that. Uh, absolutely. And actually, I thought incorrectly. I and mean, I play poker in Los Angeles, which is just about the worst place to deal poker in America because the, the crowd is just tougher and they they blame the dealer and they throw cards and they they're profane and they're they're just nasty to newcomers but I thought that when shuffle master came in for a lot of tables that that would cure the of course it didn't cure it and then there's a shuffle master 2 and we have players complaining that they shuffle master 2 has screwed them over the original shuffle master was fine but shuffle master 2 deals them bad beats all the time it's kind of hard to you, you can't reason with the irrational but yeah, being bad to dealers is is my number one pet peeve, I guess, in the poker room, especially in Los Angeles, where again they really take a lot of abuse. Do, do you play much out in in LA, or, or where, where are you based out of actually? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles, and uh, I've played mostly at Hollywood Park, which has always been close to my home. And also, uh, it was hard to find mixed games, uh, stud eight and Omaha eight over the years, and they always have stud eight, Omaha eight, and now a PLO PLO eight. So I play there. So I know all the dealers, and uh, I play. You know, when I'm in town, I would play twice a week, sometimes three times a week. So I'm in there a lot, and uh, I see what goes on, and uh, I, I I hate to have to patrol it, but uh, the poker community just is just begging to be patrolled because they just act ridiculously a lot of times in public settings california poker has a, a distinct feel to it because the the rooms are are never nice and new although i will say the bike renovated and actually hollywood gardens renovated now too so maybe that's changing but when i think of california really specifically la poker i think you show up it's it's dirty you don't want to walk in from the parking lot you get in there the, the clientele isn't exactly the most upstanding. It, 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 you, you touch the chips, you, you immediately feel that you need to wash your hands. You know, the California poker has that sort of feel to it. So not too surprising to hear that they're not exactly treating the dealers uh, too nicely either. No, you're correct. It's a tough community. Uh, you know, California poker, it, it reminds me of, it's like nobody's having a good time. When I, I grew up back East and I go to Atlantic City and that's a, you know, people, they barely tipped at the blackjack dealers. The, the blackjack tables, the, the dealers would actually mock when they got a tip. They would take that that $1 chip and bang it against the table. Tip, tip. And I said, oh, I told them that's really a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I know it's bad enough to begin with, but now you're going to be sort of mocking the customers. But when I went to Las Vegas for the first time, it was such, it was night and day t t according to, uh, next to Atlantic City. People were trying to have a good time because they're on a vacation. In the poker world, it's the same thing. Los Angeles has a lot more grinders. You don't have a lot of tourists coming into commerce and bicycle and uh, the gardens. So you have a lot more day-to-day -day grinders who are just not in a good mood and they they come in not in a good mood. And I used to, when I first went to Hollywood Park, Doug, I told people this was the, you know, this was the room of broken dreams. This is the room of broken lives. Everybody here is divorced. Everyone here just lost their job. Everyone here is pissed at their boss. And just 24 seven, I go, my goodness, I wish the public library, public library had poker because people are in a better mood when they're sitting around books. But yeah, it's your, your take on it. It was pretty, pretty spot on. Maybe you should be the the spokesman for for uh, was it Hollywood Gardens or Hollywood, Hollywood Park? Hollywood, Hollywood Park. Park. Maybe you should be their spokesman because you have so many great things to say. I'm sure they'd love to. Let's patch you up. Let's get you out there. I, I think you could spread the word. You know, I I've said this often about the Rio uh, at the outside the Amazon room, uh, the bathroom there, uh, and I say the same thing about Hollywood Park's bathroom. Uh, if we survived whatever germs were inside there, COVID nineteen was nothing. Okay, it, that's that was a that was a vaccine right there. We we had herd mentality just being in the Rio bathroom at, uh, outside the Amazon and being in the Hollywood Park bathroom. All right. Well, speaking of COVID nineteen, let's kind of let's let's use that to talk about the World Series of Poker this year because obviously it's a weird year. I, I think there was a lot of bad options on the table for the World Series of Poker. Kind of all the options sucked in different ways. And they ended up signing to go with a mandatory vaccination in order to register and play events. Um, however, dealers are not required to be vaccinated. Don't know exactly what the deal is with that. I wasn't trying to wasn't trying to, to joke. That. Whatever. I don't know what the deal is with that. What are your thoughts on what the World Series of Poker decided to end up doing? They're in a tough spot, as you as you said. Uh, it's called between a rock and a hard place with 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 the virus, and everybody's been in a tough spot. And, and I know I know that again, people. Who don't know better all have an opinion you know every everyone became an expert on viruses everyone became an expert on, on a herd mentality and everyone became an ex expert on vaccines and everything became an expert on public health since the beginning of this virus doug which is a once in a generation once in a century pandemic we've had a lot of difficult choices to make 
And it's a, it, the science on it has evolved. So this, this, you know, all you do is can do is listen to the scientists and the public health officials, and you know, move ahead as best we can. So the World Series of Poker as a business has been placed in a difficult position. Uh, I don't know which way I would have gone necessarily. I didn't want to make that decision that they made. I probably would have made the one they did, just being uh, in terms of public safety, in terms of public health, in terms of being safe before anything else. If you're going to play, I do know that the most, the majority of the players there are going to be happier. Uh, and feel certainly secure that everybody in the environment is vaccinated. So it, I, I think they went the right way. It's going to actually hurt their business this year. So it was a difficult decision, and it's still problematic. With you know, besides the pe- fact that they're they're going to there's there's still going to be there might be legal problems with it down the road with what they did. But it was really difficult, and nobody knows the answer. And I do get I do get troubled when anybody in out there in the public space starts telling us this is what we should be doing this is what we should be doing this is what we're doing and they're not you know again they're not a doctor they're not a scientist you know we just accumulate the data and we make the best decision we can and there's a lot of tough decisions here a guest we had on recently was talking about this and said that they think that they just kind of looked at the liability concerns okay so first off we need to have the series we didn't have it last year we need to have we need to have this income stream and then what's our liability like what's the cost like what's the cost of the insurance if we allow unvaccinated players versus vaccinated players. And then they think it was just a straight bottom line, makes us more money to have this, have it done this way. Do you think it actually costs them money? Yeah, I do. Even though you bring up a very simple point when I, when I was used to write a sports television column, and sometimes I have to call network executives about something. I called a guy named Don Allmeyer, who's a, a famous sports TV producer and uh, was on Monday night football producer. And I asked him a long winded question. It was a, just a ridiculous Charlie Rose type of question about some decision they make. And they went, Norman, you know, just let me, let me teach you a quick lesson right now. There's, there's no question you can ask me about anything in sports or television in which it's not a one word answer money. You know, no matter all all roads lead into the same river here, whatever uh, roads don't lead into a river, but all tributaries lead into this river. So any question you can ask me, money is going to be a factor. So even though I believe that the World Series of Poker made a prudent decision in terms of the safety of people and and the best way to kind of hedge their bet here and that way and that way, they would have looked at every aspect on a money and a financial standpoint and say this, this is the best way to go or this is the second best way to go and we won't kill ourselves. What do you think about the dealer aspect specifically? Because to have all of the players need to be vaccinated, but then to not have that same rule in place for the dealers strikes me as kind of weird. No, now you have unvaccinated people there anyway. So we're just setting the line on we're cool with some unvaccinated people if they're workers. But but what, what's sort of the deal with that? That doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't to me. I Actually, I wasn't aware of the, the, the dealer provision you're telling me about that okay. dealers do not have to be vaccinated i, I wasn't aware of that uh that's, that's my understanding I, I think initially that's what was said I, i'm not sure th- this thing's always kind of updating and changing so yeah. I, I don't want to be uh you know misspeaking here but my, my understanding is that dealers do not have to be vaccinated to to deal in the event okay that's not a lot i mean if that's the case that doesn't make sense to me uh and i don't even i don't i i'm hoping that's not the case so i would disagree with that uh there's no reason you know all, all it takes is one person not to be vaccinated who's carrying it uh, to be a, you know, a single person, super spreader, so to speak, especially in a poker setting. So yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of that, but if that's the case, that very much surprises me and that would disappoint me. Yeah. I think, I think when it comes to the spreading, um, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation because the actual having the vaccine doesn't actually prevent the transmission, um, of COVID, but your window in which you can spread it because your symptoms will be so much will be so much less bad is what changes, right? So it might be that you only have a few days where you can really transmit it versus if you're uh, unvaccinated, you, you could have potentially multiple weeks where it can Correct. be transmitted. So I, I think you're really, what you're really hoping is that you don't have as wide of a time period, to, uh, um, of a window of time where people are essentially able to spread this to other, other players in the tournament. But I, I would still anticipate we're going to have some outbreaks. I, I think that that is almost a guarantee um and, and what, what happens there what happens if we're deep in a tournament and we have COVID COVID outbreak what what, what happens in the tournament do, do they do players just blind out i mean obviously okay so let's just get this out of the way if someone tests positive for COVID, they can't continue playing the tournament right obviously that's correct clear, they, they would be taken out yes immediately so what's going to happen in some of these tournaments if we have an outbreak of COVID and we're deep in term do people just they, they just get removed do they get paid their icm value or they just get blinded out of the tournament Again, I'm not sure on that because they, they've changed that originally that once you're in, the, if you're in the money, you get removed immediately if you're not in the money 
and you 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 get blinded out, or you just get removed immediately. But even if you're in the money, let's say you know it, it paid forty, and you're thirty, and you're it's, it's they're down to thirty seven left. All your chips get taken off the table, and you get thirty seventh money. You don't get you don't get blinded out further until you can maybe you know crawl up further. So that's what was my understanding that all your chips are removed, and you're just out of the tournament. I'll, uh, tell, you, I'll tell you what, Norman, the strip clubs are going to be pretty upset about the rules this year. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know people, people are running deep in the event all of a sudden no no no, we're staying in tonight <laughs> we're not going out <laughs> the uh you know speaking of strip clubs you know poker would seem to be a super spreader bowling another super spreader uh i love the bowl and uh strip you know dollar bills everyone's handling a dollar bill and when a dollar bill hits a, a g-string uh, and then goes to somebody else. That would seem to be a super spreader situation. Uh, that, that where that one dollar bill goes, could I can't tell you how many people could spread uh, a disease. I'm gonna just leave it there. And so you say you bowl. How, how good's your bowling game? It's not particularly good. It's I've always loved the bowl. I'm about a 140 bowler. Uh, and I, you know, again, bowling like poker. I mean, poker is ridiculous because you're you're all crowded together, and, and, and you know, you're all touching cards and chips, and you're next to each other. Bowling might be worse in terms of. Uh, you're putting three of your fingers into a finger hole of a ball. And then, of course, uh, you're wearing shoes that have only been worn, uh, you know, up to 5,000 times in the last two weeks. So between that, uh, those two things and the bowling ball and all that, uh, I've missed bowling and uh, the alleys are back open again. But uh, I'd have to wait a little longer. I've actually I was just saying to Ken the other day, we passed the bowling. I mean, yeah, we should go bowling one of these days, but now maybe I'll wait. Uh, OK, a couple other World Series of Poker things. So. There was big news earlier this year. Uh, the World Series of Poker, long-standing relationship with ESPN. Uh, I, I actually don't know the, the, the number of years that it was on ESPN for, but I, I would imagine it was at least 15, if not 20 years or more um, on ESPN. And uh, I actually was able to, I actually was a part of uh, a couple of those broadcasts along the way. You have been one of the iconic members of the team, the casting team for that event. What's, what's it like with this change now and moving from ESPN over to CBS Sports? What were your thoughts on that move? Well, it was, you know, it, it was, again, another difficult move for the World Series of Poker in trying to decide what they're doing with the product. Uh, and so with ESPN, and everybody wants to be on ESPN, uh, they'd reached the point with ESPN where ESPN did not want to have the product beyond just showing it live in the summer, uh, the main event. They didn't want other bracelet events. Uh, they didn't want the post-produced re-air, the post-produced events later. So all they were down to is wanting the live event, which is, a, by the way, a great uh, a great window you're on espn but that's all they wanted so i think uh the world series of poker was looking for other ways to get other inventory out there so they moved to cbs sports network uh, an espn competitor uh seen in, in fewer homes and uh that combined with poker go is how they're going to move forward so again what i know what will surprise people this year because they've gotten used to watching the main event live on espn the last few years the main event will be alive again every single day, but it will be only on Poker Go, which is a pay service. It will not be on CBS Sports Network. The post-produced shows will be on CBS Sports Network. The post, the uh, edited shows of the 15 or 20 bracelet events that they will show on Poker Go will be on CBS Sports Network, which would be great. But just to be clear for people, the main event will be on Poker Go live for 13 straight days. Are, are the other events from the Royal Series of Poker going to be live on Poker Go as well? Yeah, so the other events, will, the final tables will be live. Uh, I'm forgetting how many number uh, n number we're doing. It might be 18 or 20. There'll be some non-hold'em events in there. I know there'll be a couple of horse events, probably a PLO. So those will be those final tables will be live on Poker Go. And then sometime after that, a lot of them will re-air in one and two-hour windows, uh, just edited down on CBS Sports Network. I think with the World Series of Poker, a lot of people were disappointed when the streams went from being free to watch basically for the series and then moved over to poker go where it was a pay service i remember watching some of those streams back in the day where you could follow along with events day to day um what are your thoughts on it moving over to poker go and and maybe what are your just some of your thoughts in general on poker go i mean i know i know how tweeted the other day that um poker go is losing a lot of money and people should kind of be thankful for what they're doing and they certainly do a lot of good for poker absolutely but what, I guess I'll just leave it there. What, what are your thoughts on Poker Go as it at least relates to World Series of Poker? Well, Poker, I mean, Poker Go is a is a great concept, and in, in in the best of all worlds, you know, they came in at the wrong time. Like if if this was 15 years ago and and we didn't have Black Friday and we had all the online stuff going on, you know, Poker the Poker Boom would have gone to unbelievable heights, and a service like Poker Go it would be rolling in cash. 
But however, that's not the case right now with, again, with the essentially U.S. facing uh, websites are not allowed to, to play. Uh, so Poker Go is in a tough position. So Poker Go, I don't know what the subscriptions are uh, for Poker Go. The, the problem right now, if from the World Series of Poker standpoint, if I'm the World Series of Poker, I, I want it to be in the mainstream as much as possible. You know, one of the things you lose when you lost – ESPN and especially a few years ago is all the re-airs at two o'clock in the morning and, and three o'clock in the afternoon on ESPN two or ESPN classic where people just be grazing and they could see an old, an, an old episode of the world series of poker. It kept it sort of in the mind of, of casual people who just watched it. Now all those episodes are behind a paywall. Poker go has the rights to everything for the world series of poker. So it's no longer out there in the mainstream, which I don't think is great for the world series of poker. Uh, what poker go hopes happens is that since, more people do people like to watch the world series of poker that more people will come to poker go and uh then more people come to poker go they make more money they get an advertising base they're able to go back out and make deals with with mainstream networks and some type of combination but overall right now for the world series of poker it, it's tough uh that most of the product is on poker go instead of all of it being on espn or, or cbs sports network it's a little bit it's a little bit weird to me too because I think that with regards to the way Poker Go is dealing with the 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 rights to to their content which obviously they own the rights to their content so they have the right to go after people as aggressively as they see fit but I guess if I was looking at it from sort of in their shoes you want people to be talking about hands you want people to be talking about players you want you want storylines you want you want you want that um sort of penetration into the into the the culture of poker and and it becomes stories and people follow it and they're interested in it and i just feel like they've been very aggressive in going after people for sharing content uh, i did a, a a video um a few weeks back where basically there was a person named poker Susie. she's not a big name in the poker world but she would share a couple of poker go hands and poker go messaged her directly and said hey take these oh, down or we're gonna take these down or we're gonna you know essentially force you to take it down you have until monday Guys, this is poker. You're, you're, I think if you're poker go and you think you know what our problem is, fucking poker Susie. She just won't. That's that's what's holding us back. No, poker Susie is not the reason that poker go has issues. Uh, when I see stuff like that, and 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 I also feel like there's been a, a real shift in poker go sort of uh, attitude over the last I don't know five six years where I know a lot of the guys at poker go and and I felt that they were were cool people. They were pretty laid back. They were just trying to do good stuff. And, and I'm not sure if, it, if it's that the, the company's losing money or what, but it seems like there's been a shift from let's be just, you know, just this purely good, positive sort of force in poker. And it's kind of shifted a bit more into let's protect our space and go after people. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll say this. They, they have talked to me multiple times about the content I did about their stuff. And we kind of went back and forth. And at one point they tried to get me to sign a document and said I wouldn't make fun of them. Serious stuff that, that happened. Uh, I don't want to talk too much shit about Poker Go because overall they have been they have been nice to me. But I don't know. I just feel I feel like Poker Go is caught in a tough in a tough place where they're trying to make a subscription model work on something that should it be a subscription model? I I, I kind of think not. What are your thoughts on the model? Yeah, that was again a tough business decision for them. They originally Poker Poker Central, which is the the, the Sorry, company that correct. owns Poker Go. Uh, they originally were trying to make it as a, a you know a, a linear cable network, like a, an old fashioned uh, tennis channel, golf channel, and they got very little clearance. But before I had anything to do with them, you know, they they, they were maybe in five million homes when there's a hundred plus. Uh, 100 million plus homes. They never got into more than a few cable systems. So they decided to switch their model to digital. Uh, and it's a tough, it's, I think it's a tough way to go. I, I, I don't know the numbers of how they could make it the other way this way. You know, I, I know when I have friends of mine who I try to talk into going to poker go and sometimes they go, yeah, I like poker, but you know, $10 a month isn't that much, but you know, Netflix is 10 or $12 a month. And on Netflix, you get the whole world. Uh, on poker go you get poker so it's a tough way to go and it's they got to make money by subscriptions and then if they don't have subscriptions they can't get ad revenue so right now they they would be losing money because the subscriptions are so low they can't get outside advertisers and i do believe you were right also i, I you know i hate to agree with you on this but i, I remember poker Susie. she posted like a, a clip of phil helmuth and negrano in their heads up it's like a 60 second clip and i just think Maybe again, it might come from the top. It's like an overzealous legal department. We're saying, you know, they 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 read out the riot act. We will come after you and your your firstborn uh, if you don't take down this clip. And to me, it, it'd be beneficial if this is an entertaining clip. You might see it on Twitter and go, wow, that's that's pretty cool. I, I you know I might might want to see more of that sometime. How do you see more of that? You go to Poker Go. 
So I, I do believe it was like cutting off your nose to spite your face to tell them or tell you that you can't do a short clip. I understand what they're trying to protect their content, but there's a difference between somebody lifting, you know, it's, it's like when people used to do black market uh, on pay-per-view and cable where they do something with the telephone wires and some Russian would come in like they did on Sopranos to give you free cable. That's different. You want to protect yourself against people stealing your product. But this is Poker Susie saying, this is a pretty cool 60 seconds. Let me just show it to people. That you want, it seems to me, and that's what they, I thought they were overzealous on, as you said. Totally, totally agree. It's going to lead to signups. I will say, just to just to defend Poker Go a little bit here, um, they do have a nice, they do have a very nice product. They have great, uh, the the quality of the the footage is great. That they get big names on there. They have good show ideas. They they do have a good product. So um, from that kind of side of things, uh, you know, you, you talk about Netflix's price versus Poker Go. Obviously, they're not Netflix, but for what they're doing in sort of a, a niche space, I, I think that they do a very good job with it, and they're very professional. And uh, you know, putting putting out something that's good is just uh, the, the model is sort of sort of the question mark for me. But going back to talking about the the World Series of Poker, so um, so are there going to be any any changes here that people can kind of expect now that it's moving over from ESPN to CBS Sports? Other, is there anything that's that's changing that's dramatic, um, or is it going to be pretty similar? I think. It, there's no dramatic changes. Uh, still, Poker Go, Poker Productions, which does the World Series of Poker, is still is still doing it. So I think it'll be largely the same. The live product will be as you've seen it the last few years, and it'll be Lon McCarron and myself and, and Jamie Kerstetter, I imagine. And then on the bracelet bracelet events, which they started doing a few years ago to show onto uh, ESPN eventually on live, it'll be Ali Najad and, and David Tuckman uh, and maybe Jeff Platt doing it with. Poker pros commenting on it. Nothing of any dramatic uh, difference that I can think of. Where did you and Lon first meet? Can you can you, can you walk us through? Was it romantic? Can you walk us through the first the first day you guys set eyes on each other? Yeah, well, I I you know I, I bumped into his chest because he's about a foot taller than me, and I looked up and he said, "Oh yeah, we're we're doing the poker together uh, in a day or two. I did not know Lon. He did you know he said he he knew me through uh, reading my. Uh, football I used to do NFL picks columns that were syndicated so he read those in the northern california area but yeah we we met at the the money maker year we met on like day 2 of the world series whatever day he got in there we both got in there a day or two apart and we met and we actually you know got along pretty well for not knowing each other and then when you're together as long as we've been together you better get along pretty well because you spend a lot of hours in a in a small you know voicing booth and you spend a lot of time together so I always give Lon more credit than myself. I'm more difficult to get along with. I'm a little more crotchety. You don't have to agree. So you know, with your head going, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I know I've walked up to you uh, when well, you're playing events you and say, "Why, truth, why are you dress this way?" I mean, this when is you ridiculous. speak the truth. I have to agree. I don't know what you want <laughs> yeah. me to say. But I mean, I'm tougher. I'm tougher to get through the day with. Lon is much more easygoing, uh, much more of a people person. Uh, so uh, yeah, we've gone along the whole time. You know, it's it's been 17 or 18 years now. And uh, from early on, we just had a good rapport with each other. So uh, it's it's been almost natural for us uh, when we've been together. You guys have a really nice one-two punch where he does a little more of the play-by-play -play and you do the the color. And it, it really has a it has a a really good synerg synergistic effect when you guys commentate together that I just I have a hard time seeing anyone really being able to sort of reproduce in in the poker sphere i've not seen anyone that gets close there are people that are very good i think of nick shulman i think he, he does a great job obviously all these ali najah is great too um but i think in terms of, of that one two kind of punch you guys have something that's that's truly truly special um when it comes to commentating poker well i appreciate it we i mean we're just trying to have fun with it and we it is like an oil and vinegar thing so as you said he does the play-by-play -play and he's more the straight man and um you know i'm just making jokes or just doing what i do or going off on rants and he either responds to them or ignores them but you know there's a good back and forth there and again you get you know when you do it for more than one or two years you sort of know it's like being married if you're married long enough i never really had that chance but you get to know you've your heard, you've heard you've heard it's like being married yeah so you you know you, you know you fit like a hand in a glove you understand you know you's like you know what your partner's gonna say before they say it you know when to pause you do that and i've actually seen that with you know many longtime broadcast teams in in regular sports you know whether it's summerall and madden in in, in the nfl or uh, anybody working with dick vital for espn so they just you know you, you just do a back and forth that just becomes sort of natural and you understand your role how many years have you guys done the World Series Poker Main Event together? So we actually, you know, Lon did the year before I did. Uh, he did it the Robert Varconi year, 02, with Gabe Kaplan. 
which was like a two hour, like a two hour final table taped. And so we started in 03 when ESPN expanded to seven episodes. Uh, so we both did it in 03. We've done it all the way till now. Last year, where they did an online hybrid uh, World Series main event. I did not do it because I was under the weather. So uh, Lon did that one with Jamie Kerstetter. But we did, we've done it together pretty much since 03. I, yeah, I see. I see Jamie joining you guys on, on in some casting spots. What, what are your thought on, thoughts on Jamie's uh, poker commentating? You know, we 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 found her on the streets. She was selling pencils. Uh, you know, so her poker game is just not that solid. So she, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, she's a you know, she's the circuit grinders, and then there are circuit grinder wannabes. So she's a circuit grinder wannabe. That's that's pretty low. You know, you just so she's just looking for you know buy-ins for two hundred dollar you know no limit hold'em events in Hammond, Indiana. So we just we ran into her. She was a natural, actually. You know, she's actually so Jamie is actually like almost the, the perfect person that I would like to be around in a booth as far as a poker player goes. It's somebody who understands the strategy, but then is just has a great sensibility, a great sense of humor and understands there's more to the game. than why did he, you know, you know, why did he three bet with a pair of Jackson UF uh, UTG plus two? So I don't care so much about that. Jamie can explain that in sort of simple terms as can Antonio Sfandiari for, for a casual viewer. Uh, and then they know how to play around and just have a good time in the booth and look at the bigger picture stuff. Jamie actually worked with my team and helped us write some jokes uh, on a lot of my videos. And uh, once in a while, she'd help me on Twitter because you know I, I could always use the pointers. She'd she'd get in there and, and fix my tweets and stuff. Um, she 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 did great work for for Poker News Productions while she worked with us. And uh, you know I'm, I'm glad to see her doing. Um, I don't know. I, I I wouldn't want to say bigger and better things, but maybe. <laughs> good, good, good to see her. Uh, you know, getting landing those positions, and she's she's fantastic. I mean, she's extremely sharp. She has a great sense of humor, and then yeah, we actually did some commentary together uh, in Cabo recently for the 25k heads up tournament that was going on down there for, that Poker Kings put on, and uh, yeah, great, great to be around too. Yeah, I you know I my when I'm watching somebody on TV, my my general standard is would I want to sit next to him on a bar uh, for a long period of time. So when guys are too overly analytical, Tim McCarver used to do this in baseball. I don't want Vital shouting at me for two and a half hours. You know, if it's somebody who I want to move to the end of the bar or even just decide to stop drinking and walk out of the bar, I don't want to listen to him. Jamie, I could sit next to in a bar. Uh, you know, for an hour or two, like I would with a friend of mine, because she's just she's just easy to get along with, very easygoing, very soft spoken, and has a great sense of humor. This is actually a problem that I definitely have with with my commentary when I look back and watch it later. When I'm watching poker, I'm used to I'm used to thinking of it as a player, which is I'm thinking about well, what would I do, what should I do here, what's my range like, what size makes sense, and so I'm watching a hand, and I'm and I'm not thinking about it enough, like. What does the average person watching want to hear from me right now? I'm thinking about it like, oh, here's what these sh here's what's happening. This is the range of asymmetries. This is the size that makes sense. This is the way you want to be. And I'm and, and I'm and I'm breaking it down in my mind. And I'm thinking and I'm trying and I'm thinking this is great. Everyone is going to be is going to love what I'm talking about right now. And then this comes, oh my god, Doug, shut the fuck up. Will this guy just let it go? We get it. The guy has kings. The other guy doesn't. Just let this die. You know, <laughs> people are just tilted, tilting their face off in the chat. I, I, I it's tough. I think as it's, it's actually, I think that it's an advantage to have not played poker at a really high level when it comes to, to commentary and analysis, because I think when you have played poker at a really high level, you feel like you don't want to be mischaracterizing situations and you don't want to be providing inadequate information to let people play well. You want to give a really honest, accurate, here's what's happening right now, guys. Uh, but, but you don't need that. And and I think in sports, it's the same thing. You don't need to know that the receiver is running this certain route because they're doing this zone defense and there's a gap in the defense here and they're exploiting it by having this guy run. You don't, you know, if they throw it to him and he, and he runs far, they can explain that, but you don't need that every play because there's too many things happening in a play to be able to break down every single thing that's happening like that. You're just going to take up too much airtime and you're going to bore people and they're going to want to just be focused on the, on the action itself. So there's definitely this this balancing act that I think I need to do a better job of when I do commentary of kind of well, you know being being the guy that'd be fun to, to drink at with the bar instead of being the guy that's boring you to tears with uh, a calculator. No, you've shown me just now in, in the uh, ongoing genesis and maturity of, of one Douglas Pope that uh, you you get it. This that, what you just said is my number. You know, I've, I just used to do this for a living because I wrote a sports television column, which is a ridiculous thing to do. I wrote a sports television column for for ten or fifteen years, and my number one complaint is what you're talking about. That when the analyst is talking 
after every play and trying to break down every route or trying to tell you about the difference between a short hop and a, or a, a sweep slide and this type of slide in baseball. It just wears us out. Most of us are actually just there because we're rooting for a team or rooting against a team or now in fantasy because we want to see how a player does. We don't want all of that. So it's either you're, if you're watching by yourself, these guys just wear you out. And if you're watching with a bunch of other people, by the way, you're talking to the other people in the room. You're not even listening to them. So there's no reason to spend all that time going through all that analysis. And when you're doing what you were doing, Doug, if you're talking about you were trying to you know, figure out the range and, and, and do all the high level, top level poker analysis stuff, you're really preaching to a small choir. Uh, most people out there don't want that. They, they want to, you know, they're, they're rooting for a player. They want to see big pots. They want to hear table talk. So that's pretty much my mantra. This is just, it, you know, they're, it, it, it's a, it, it, you know, it's just a game. Let's have fun with it and don't overanalyze. It, it, it gets tough though, I think, because it feels a little bit inauthentic in a way, to, at least to me. And maybe, maybe it feels like this to other people that really know something well to, to, try, to take something that's pretty beautiful and complex and then boil it down to, wow, look at that race. I don't know. It just, it feels, it feels, uh, it feels sort of inauthentic to not be talking about the things that are interesting to you. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to recognize that it's the view, the average viewer is much different than, than you. Um, Cause you're an expert and when you're an expert, something you're going to see different things than what the average viewer sees. Have you ever tried watching, for example, a chess stream when grandmasters play and they have some, in, in, uh, some, some master on there explaining the moves you yes. get blown out. You get blown out of the water in in, in five seconds. You're like, oh, all right. Well, I I can see I'm not needed here. <laughs> you, you got that right. I'm always shouting it. I've watched several of them. I've sh I start shouting at my my laptop screen because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously not part of the audience that they want. And I I would like to watch a little chess. I used to play chess, but they are dealing it with you talking about the highest level of what we're dealing with here. And again, so it's a very small audience. You're just not expanding the game. Right there's there's a there's a sweet spot in there that you want to be aiming for for sure. What what do you think about down the road? Okay, let's just say you know 50, 70 years. Whenever you and Lon are done, um, who who's gonna ta who's gonna carry the torch? Who who's gonna step up and, and take over the iconic voices that that you got? Those those are some big shoes to fill. Do you see any any potential talent in the weeds that could one day you know wear those shoes? No, I mean, I, I remember, you know, Rembrandt got this question uh, when he was at the top of his game painting. Uh, and he probably said, when I put my brush down and you know they put me six feet under, you know, the Renaissance should be over. So no, nobody, I don't see anybody replacing me. Uh, Lon, you know, is more of just a, a you know, base, you know, Lon's a Columbia School of Broadcasting voice. You can find somebody, oh, well, so it's a poker now. Eh. You can find that anywhere. But uh, no, in all seriousness, <laughs> by the way, everybody, as I, I always, when I was covering sports television, uh, in 1990, on the eve of the Final Four on March Madness, Brent Musburger, who was the biggest sportscaster on CBS, he did he did the NFL Today. He was he did he did he did their golf. He did he did everything they had, uh, probably other than golf. So he was a number one voice, and he was a number one voice of college basketball forever. Working with uh, Billy Packer, they fired him. They fired him on the eve of the Final Four. Said this is your final thing. So that if you if if Brent Musburger who was the number one guy at CBS, everybody's replaceable. And they, they just got rid of him. And they just thought he was like an 800, apparently he was like an 800 pound monster around the office. And they decided we're never going to let somebody get that big again. And actually they did in the next generation, Jim Nance got that big again, but apparently not with the whatever. Wait, physically big? No, not physically big. Got oh, that no. big again. It's probably as a force at, at the network. Jim Jim Nance does, you know, he's the number one NFL voice. Yeah, he's the Nance number one. Of course, college basketball voice. He's a number one golf voice. That's huge. That would usually be three different people. But so everybody's replaceable and they usually uh, it's easier to fire you when they don't like you. So they, they apparently didn't like Brent personally. But but is everyone replaceable? I, I, I think that at least currently today, there would be such a downgrade from you guys to, to the next the next duo that I, I, I kind of feel you're not replaceable because there has to be some level of knowledge of poker. And, and admittedly, it's not a lot of knowledge of poker, but you need some knowledge of poker in order to, ha to do the job you guys do. Yeah, but it's still a lot of luck involved with this stuff. Doug. Seriously, I, I remember a, a, a friend of mine's father who was a really smart guy uh, who passed away a few years ago who was in the, in the writing business told me that, you know, people don't understand that the difference between Frank Sinatra, who's sometimes called, you know, the greatest male uh, uh, voice uh, in, in the singing world of all time, just for Frank Sinatra and some other crooner who was working the Ramada Inn lounge uh, in Hobo Hoboken, where he was from. Sometimes there can be virtually no difference in their talent 
we like to think that you know, like something rises way above, but then just because of connections or because it, it, things don't always break even, you know, it, their variance in, in life does not, it's not always uh, equal. Frank Sinatra goes on to fame and the other guy who has just about as good of a voice doesn't even get a job as a singer and ends up working, you know, as an actuary. So there's, there's really, it's just, there's just, one pebble can make a difference. And so it might seem that somebody is just so much better and then somebody else can't be as good and vice versa. There's so many different ways, by the way, to skin this cat as we're just talking about poker broadcasting. So many different ways to bring to, to bring the broadcast to people, whether it's more strategy laden, whether it's less strategy laden, whether it's live or taped. There's no one right way. And so, yeah, whatever seems like you just get used to something. And so you think, oh, yeah, when, when they're gone, what are we going to do? Then whoever replaces it, you know, I, I'm old enough to know who, who's doing Jeopardy before Alex Trebek. And he was unbelievably good. And you, I couldn't imagine anyone but Art Fleming. And this is before Jeopardy was a, a, a nighttime uh, syndicated sensation. It was a, a daytime game show. Nobody could replace Art Fleming. Then Alex Trebek came along and he's a different guy. And Alex Trebek's 10 times bigger than Art Fleming. So that's that's pretty much the way it worked in most of entertainment. What, what do you think about the recent uh, Jeopardy situation? I've not been following it very closely. So maybe you can tune me in a little bit. But my understanding is that the guy who they gave the job to kind of was in charge of the process to some extent of picking out the next person and put himself near the top of the list. What can you can you break down what happened recently on Jeopardy and what your thoughts are on it? There's so many elements to break down. I'll try to do it simply. But yes, the, the executive producer of Jeopardy, who was in charge of the process. Uh, also auditioned for the job. They had 15 or 20 guest hosts that came on and did it a week each. He was then chosen for the job. Okay. And then, and that, of course that's going to, obviously that brings up a lot of jokes right there, but the, the Sony picture, Sony studio, which, which was part of a committee that was looking at them. They all said he was the best person. When I talked to Jeopardy people, they said, yeah, a lot of them are really, really good, but actually this guy, Mike Richards had a certain way to him. He's a little smarmy, but he was really, really good. So he has a lot. He used to host other shows anyway. So he gets the job. OK, it is then discovered afterwards, mostly by, a, I think, a journalist from The Ringer or uh, who just looked into his background because he had a couple of sexual harassment suits from a few years ago. He said, ah, yeah, I'm past that. It was no big deal. Uh, so she decided to start poking around and she found out he had a bunch of bad stuff, including coming on to his own podcast uh, eight or nine years ago and making fun of uh, Jewish people, making fun of fat people. Uh, he, he, he made fun of people from Haiti. He had a bunch of comments that, you know, just get you fired. So they took a look at that a week or two later and they said, that's no good. So they said, but he, we're going to keep him as executive producer, which is amazing. That makes no sense at all. And then the furor over him a week later was so great. He said, I'm going to have to step aside as executive producer. So he finally got fired from everything. But the fact that they didn't vet him beforehand in this day and age is just amazing. Just somebody working, you know, just a working journalist just went out and looked into his past. Wouldn't they do that as well? They didn't. And so he didn't get the job. And now they're starting the search all over again. Maybe they just thought because he'd come this far that there couldn't be that many skeletons buried in the closet because I think I think that some people just seem to get by because people assume that if there was an issue, we would know by now. But then obviously you have the big things that pop up, the, the Deshaun Watson thing that happened somewhat recently, the, you know, going back to even the Cosby thing. That was shocking when that happened. I mean, I, I, I had never heard anyone say a single thing about Cosby of that nature. And then all of a sudden it was you know, many, many people had had this experience. And, you know, I, I guess maybe there's some degree of when when people get to a certain level of success or stature, then they, everyone just kind of assumes that their past checks out when that when that might, might not be the case. Uh, that's usually not the case. I mean, we all have skeletons in our closet. And I've always, you know, not that I'm ever going to be powerful or would be wealthy, but I've always feared power and money because it does change you and you think you play by a different set of rules. That's why it's different for, for difficult for young athletes who get multi-million dollar contracts when they're 20, 21, 22 years old, not to make mistakes. You just, you just, you just full of yourself and you've never been told, no one ever tells you what to do. You've been a, you know, you've been celebrated since you were 12 years old because you can shoot the ball well, or you can throw a long pass. So it's really difficult to make, and poker players often after their big score, their first big score, they have a half oh. million dollars. Yeah, that, that's gone so, so quickly. Good. <laughs> no good. No, it's so good. It's so yeah. good watching that happen. Yeah. 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 They just blow it away. And so uh, even, even the great Mike Sexton told me when he, when he went to, when he left the world poker tour to go back to party poker. He said they made an offer he couldn't refuse. And he said, you know, I, I, I you know, I blew a fortune at a at late in this stage in his life because he was part of the Party Poker original. He's part of the World Poker Tour. Party Poker originally made him a rich man. He said, I had such a fortune. He says, I can't, I don't, I can't possibly think of blowing a fortune a second time. That's how he was, that's how stupid he was, he says, the first time when he got all this money when he was 60 or 65 or in his 60s. So even at a later age, you can make a lot of mistakes. And so when you're in your 20s and you get that first big score, 
oh my goodness, I, it's it's going to be gone within twelve months usually. The decisions I see people, I saw people make when I was around that age, and, and I'm going to even put myself in there. The decisions I made when you when you're that age and you start to actually you know make some money playing poker, it, it, it's just amazing. Let's say you have a million dollar score. Let's just assume you're going to pay whatever 40 ish percent federal at the time and then five five ish percent state depending on what state you live in okay now you're down to 550k all right then you blow some just buying dumb shit let's just say you spend 50k there you're down to half a million now now let's say you go on a poker downswing you lose one or 200k you're playing a bit bigger than you used to play so maybe the the hits are now you're down to a quarter million and then before you know it i mean you live for a year you haven't made money maybe you're at 100 where did your money go well it went all those things and and people just have this score and think they're good for the rest of the rest of your life. You're, you're, you're not. And, and also another thing with, with poker tournaments, people tend to generally swap or have backers or whatever. So when you see someone has a big score and you think, wow, how is Jamie gold broke now? I'm just kidding. I don't know if Jamie gold's broke. That was just a, you know, offhand. I, who knows? No one really knows other than Jamie, but you think, how is that possible? Well, you don't know about all the other things going on that are part of the story that can, you know, kind of add up here to where the amount of money you won isn't really, what you want and, and olivier bousquet actually came on this podcast uh, um, a month or two ago and was talking about how he really dislikes how we put the hand of mobs up we show all the money that they've won in this glamorous light when the reality is there's buy-ins that's a pretty big thing to, to deduct and then of course you think about things like taxes stuff like that the amount of money that people are winning at the top is actually uh, a lot smaller than people might think without question and olivier brings up a good point and I, it's, it's always been a pet peeve of mine because you know poker it's at the end of the day is whether you're ahead or you're behind and we we put up a you know we're just putting up you know tournament money one that means nothing you need to know if they're up or down and when I for the year and I remember when I first started poker I got a, a, a poker reporter pulled me aside to tell me how deceiving it was because he said the card player of the year and it was that year is the it was Amir Vahidi who passed away a few years ago the card player player of the year he said would be just in tournaments alone forget whatever he's doing in cash games and for tournaments alone he's the card player player of the year and he's in the red. He, you know, he plays all these tournaments. He just cashes, but he's playing. He's there's no, you know, he's he's in the red because of the tournament buy-ins. And I learned that early on. And obviously, any game in which ten percent of the field is being paid, and now sometimes it's fifteen percent, uh, you don't have to be a you know a nuclear scientist to understand that ninety percent of the people who walk into the door that day are going to lose their buy-in. So obviously, most people are losing money, and even people who are cashing and min cashing again and again and again are losing money in the long term. And it's kind of deceiving with Hendon Mob that we just take a look at tournament earnings or tournament caches. You also don't need to be a nuclear scientist to realize that if the house is taking 10 to 15% out of the, out of the buy-in, that there's not going to be as many winners as there's going to be losers. And that adds up in quite a hurry. You know, I forgot that too. I tried to explain poker to all my friends who don't play poker about the house, about just not even terms, just cash poker. I say, if you give everybody $10, 10 people, $10, and the house is taking $1 out of every pot, after 100 hands, everybody is broke and the house has $100. That's what that's the, that's the reason poker, half the people don't win and half the people don't lose. Most people have to lose. And they go, oh, why do people play poker? Oh, you don't but understand. Do you, think, do you think maybe, though, that would force the professionals out and then it would be a softer... No, I'm not going to... Oh, no, you're going to go that way. <laughs> there you go. Good, no, good no, no, I no. You, I didn't know I was leading you down that path. No, no, no. I, that's old Doug. New Doug wears, wears uh, dress shirts. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, but rake's a huge factor when it comes to, to to winning in poker as well. And I think that it's a little more honest at the higher stakes tournaments because typically rake as a percentage of the buy-in drops pretty substantially. So in a hundred K, they're not charging 15K rake or 12K yeah. rake. They're usually charging two or three, five K rake, one K rake, whatever it is, depending on and I think some of the tournaments um at Aria, if you show up on time, you actually don't pay rake. I think I heard that somewhere. So there's plenty of formats where you know the rake is much lower at the higher stakes but the lower stakes it can be pretty tremendous so you definitely kind of have to factor that in too when you're looking at how profitable are people really i mean i i get it on one hand you you want people to look at poker in a favorable light and think wow the dream i can do this right i could be one of these guys one day that, that makes millions of dollars so i i think sort of embracing some of the the glamorous side of poker is good for the game good for the longevity of the game and 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 i also think that um embracing winning as as being okay and being a part of the game is something that is sort of falling behind at least in the online poker world where more and more we see winning players targeted or you know mm -hmm. sites don't want them to play there or we make games that are not beatable poker should be a game where you can win money and we should honor the people that do so i i, I like those aspects i guess it's just when it when it goes from that to being a facade that's really where the problem is yeah, and it, it, we don't need to be that extreme. It is a facade sometimes. So I think you're right. We we should celebrate the winning 
emphasize the fact that you can win. And obviously a lot of people do win, but I don't like the dishonesty in making it all seem like you guys are making seven figure scores and walking around waving to the crowd uh, every day of the week. It's a tough, you know, it's the old thing, the old expression. It's a, a, a tough way to make an easy living. It's a really tough way uh, to make a living. Have you, have you ever played poker professionally when you were younger? No, no, I played, you know, I started playing non-social poker, uh, after I got out of college, we were playing like, you know, $40 anytime limit game with all, all different types of mixed games. But I wouldn't, I never even imagined playing it professionally. Uh, I would never be good enough to play it professionally, nor would I study enough to play it professionally. So, uh, I just always enjoyed trying to win and the social aspect of it. So mixed games, you're especially then that's where you do your best work. Yeah, and I put uh, quotes around best work uh, as far as poker goes. You know, as, as, as I'm a better than an average rec player, but yeah, I could I could never I, I never played no limit hold'em, uh, and, and again, nobody played when we played home games and and even the, the larger cash games before rounders, nobody played no limit hold'em at home. Hardly anybody played it, and people keep forgetting back. You know, besides the fact that limit hold'em and seven stud ruled poker in the 60s and 70s and in the 80s back in when they when they started the world series of poker and they had to decide what the quote unquote main event was going to be uh no limit hold'em barely won over deuce to seven no limit single draw was going to be the world championship it was that or, or no or no limit hold'em i think we can all be pretty glad that no limit hold'em won out <laughs> <laughs> the old guy the deuce to seven i, I even I, i'm not a low, i'm not a, a no limit hold'em fan but that's I'm glad it won out, but the old guys will tell you that deuce to seven, no limit, uh, single draw is the purest form of poker. I, I hear that a lot. Why do why do people say that? I, the reason they say, first of all, it sounds cool, so people just repeat it. But you have the least amount of information in front of you, so at least in in, in hold them, you have a board, uh, so you can you, that can factor and and say you, you, nobody, you know, you're playing draw and single draw, and it's it's your read against the other guy, and it's your feel against the other guy, and you just. It's bang. You, you, you know, you got to have the right to intuition. Uh, the math is greatly reduced, obviously, in this situation, even online. So that's what I call it. It's like the purest form of gambling within poker. Uh, and I know gamblers, just like with uh, the, the, the Badugi, Badesi, and all those games that are played no limit, though they love the gamblers love to play that the most. The the less things are solved and the less information, the more the more gambling seems like Without it's question. happening. I, I do think it's funny that that when I'm told about the history of poker, right? So I'm 32 years old and I've been playing poker in, in, in events for, you know, since 2010. And I'm told about how No Limit Hold'em was not really that popular back in the day. But it, it, as an adult, it's it's always been the game, right? It's always been the popular game type. I think back to when I was a kid. I remember when I was six, seven years old, my dad, he'd go play in a five card draw game. They'd play for quarters and stuff and they'd all go kick back some beers and play some five card draw. And man, those are probably some pretty soft games now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe I, I'm ready to see if those are still going on. Yeah, you see, you could have nickeled your dime into your fortune with those games. Uh, just take you longer, but uh, they were pretty soft games. What? So, was it really the just the Chris Moneymaker effect that that made No Limit Hold'em sort of blow up, or were there other sort of factors yeah. there too? I, you know, I get I've thought about it a lot because I, I, you know, a question we, we think about is what, what's the poker boom if if Sammy Farha wins? Okay, and there would have been a poker boom, just not quite as big. Uh, there were three things that it just it was a confluence of three things that happened that year that had not happened before. So it, we had the whole card cam for the first time. So it could be plausible to watch these games. When I saw that the tapes of the stuff that they did earlier with no whole card cam, it was next to impossible for the any casual person to watch. Uh, so you had the whole card cam came in. That's number one. You had the world poker tour. You had ESPN showing world series coincidentally. And this is because of the whole card cam in on mass for the first time and you had the work world poker tour was created on the travel channel at the same time with the whole card cam so that was poker on cable in two spots a whole lot first time ever and then the, the biggest factor in a way was online poker which had not existed a generation before had not existed 10 years ago so between the whole card cam the wpt and espn and online there was going to be a boom and then you put the money maker on top of that that he wanted a guy named money maker you know would put still Bucks in and won two and a half million. Still it's seems like, like a scam. Huh? Still seems like a scam, right? It does. It seems like you know people who don't think we put a man on the moon think Chris Moneymaker must have been you know they, they scripted that's he's on the casting couch somewhere in Hollywood and they put his last name Moneymaker. So that's just that was the the cherry on top of this boom and that made it explode. But there still would have been there still would have been a big big growth in poker that year if Sammy Farhad won. 
What are your thoughts on the WPT? Because the WPT seems so sort of separate from everything else that goes on in poker. It seems, I mean, it's very, obviously it's a different brand, but it seems so not kind of intertwined where a lot of these other companies' events seem to be sort of in the vicinity. WPT seems like its own thing entirely. What are your thoughts on WPT? Yeah, I never, I guess for, for years, especially in the first few years, the WPT, it is a separate entry uh, an entity and they did it differently. You know, I love the fact that the original producers of the World Series of Poker uh, in showing the main event, you would make it seem like gambling in old Las Vegas and, and even the colors they use behind the main table. It just felt like gritty Las Vegas gambling and telling stories of different players and all that. The WPT was almost like a game show. We have six people who come out here. It's almost like who wants to be a millionaire? They have six players. They didn't do those backstories. They just this, 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 this. And it was a different product. It was harder for me to watch because it was more about the poker. Uh, and the main event was more about the scene, particularly on day one and day two and day three. But the World Poker Tour, which I never knew how it continued as a business model, uh, made some really smart choices somehow, and they've continued. And you know they are a staple now, and they're, they're good for poker. But I, I always had, even though I enjoyed listening to, to, to Vince Van Patten and Mike Sexton, I had a, more trouble watching that broadcast than I would with the main event was, even if I was, you know, I'm not talking about me broadcasting it. Just the main event, this, just the, the sensibility of what the production was, was more up my alley than the World Poker Tour. It does feel a little bit weird to not have Sexton involved in it anymore. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, rest in peace, Sexton passed away, I, I want to say a year or two ago now. Yeah, um, a, true, a, a, a true legend uh, uh, of the game of poker that is, you know, missed by, by many. Um, but it, it feels a little it feels a little weird now to not have him as a part of that because he was so iconic with that brand. Yeah, he was. And and he actually was, you know, he's he, he's like the, the the prime ambassador of poker for a generation. He was a great businessman in poker. He, he, you know, he understood the growth potential of poker before a lot of other people did. And the other great thing about Mike is besides the fact that he loved poker dearly, is that he was as good as everybody said he was in terms of how great he was to the fans. He he, he had time for everybody. He loved the game. He promoted the game endlessly. He was you know it was never upset at the table. He was you know always had an even disposition. And uh, you know as I told you earlier, he says he blew that first fortune. Some of that was his sports bad business ventures, sports betting, and betting on golf. You know losing a lot of money at golf. But at the poker table, he he was just even keeled, and uh, he was just a pleasure to be around. I only met him a few times, but every time I met him, he seemed in a good mood. He was nice to me. He, I mean, he was just he was just pleasant to be around. So that that checks out with with my personal experience experiences with him for sure. Um, going back to talk about the main event. Uh, so there's something about the main event that is truly hard to describe if you have not been to the Rio and sort of been there during it. Could you maybe describe for some people that have not had the opportunity to go play the main event what it's like at the Rio during that during that um, shit show? Is that, is that maybe the word to use? <laughs> it's a, I wouldn't call it a shit show. It's a, it's a it's a circus of characters. Uh, at some days, it's a clusterfuck. Uh, there's just you know there's long lines to get into a very 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 nasty bathroom. But it's it's a, if you are a poker player. Even the most casual poker player, who again is just playing a monthly game at home with your with your buddies, to walk into the Rio on a day one, to walk into the Amazon room for some reason even more than the Pavilion, which is actually a bigger room, but the Amazon has this feel to it. To walk into essentially a football field of two hundred tables with chips clattering and the lighting in it and the table number over it. It's like, it's, it's a wow factor. It was, I mean, when I was a kid, I, it was a wow factor to me when I saw the Grand Canyon or I saw Mount Rushmore uh, or stuff like that. I saw the Statue of Liberty as a seven or eight-year-old up close for the first time. If you're a poker person, there actually is almost that equivalent to walk into the Rio uh, and, and see what that is. The main event is different than anything else because there's just so many people. So, it, you know, it's like it's, 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 it's Woodstock indoors uh, and instead of, uh, and actually some players still are getting high. I say back in Woodstock, there was a lot of, there's a lot of weed, but now coming out of break, play changes coming out of break. Uh, you can smell it. You can smell you it. You can always smell it when they come back to the table. But yeah, I, I always tell people that if you you know if you can get there one if if it's a goal for you to get there, you do want to get there one time. Just to, and just if you're playing another tournament at the at, at, in the Amazon room, it's just a great feel to walk in there for the first time. You know, it's like Yankee Stadium for for poker. There is an epicness that you can't get anywhere else, and. Uh, with regards to the Amazon room versus the pavilion pavilion is a much bigger room, but pavilion just feels like I'm in a big warehouse and everyone's playing poker because I think we're in a warehouse. No, it's a convention <laughs> center. Uh, but you're in just this big, huge open room and, and the massiveness is just so vast that you almost get lost in it. 
Whereas the Amazon has sort of a specific layout and there's a lot of tables in Amazon, but it's done sort of strategically. And as you get deeper in tournaments, you move closer and closer to the stage and, and there's less and less tables. So there's a um, there's a specialness, I think, to Am the Amazon room specifically that you just simply don't get in the pavilion. Uh, without question, I would call pavilion a warehouse too. So it's like the, the, the difference between, you know, shopping in and maybe uh whole foods versus shopping at costco because this is this huge warehouse that, that's where they play the cash games during the world series i hardly ever play the cash games just because i don't want to be in the pavilion anymore it doesn't feel like a regular cash game you just feel like you're just in some huge shopping mall and it doesn't have the feel of playing poker uh the amazon does have a special feel you just brought another thing as as they break down the tables and it gets smaller and smaller and you get closer to where the feature the tv setup is it it's just a great feeling plus it gets colder in there because it's, it's again it's a big room there's hardly any people left in there and the temperature drops in there five or ten degrees when there's no people in there so it's just a, a great feeling as you get closer to the making the final table are are you playing any events this summer yeah this i used fall? to play sorry you can't even say summer this fall are you this playing fall. events this fall i generally play three or four events uh, always mixed games this year i decided to do something i would never do otherwise they, they did create a new event to open the world series which is a twenty five thousand dollar horse uh, i always love playing the horse i would never play a 25k when i play the 10k stud eight or something like that i'm always half backed or two-thirds backed by my friends because i like playing for my friends also and I, it's it's actually more disappointing to not cash because they don't get their money back than it is for me. I expect that I'm not going to get my money back. They actually think, oh, yeah, maybe Norman do something. Oh, really? What are you, nuts? So I feel bad, but they're all putting in a small amount of money. So this year I decided I would play the 25K. I would get backed by people I know, on just followers on Twitter and friends of mine. And I would do a 1.5 markup. I hate the markup, uh, the markup debate in poker, uh, but I do a 1.5 markup with the 0.5 markup all going to charity. So and in, my, my, in, my, in my mind, it would be 250 people backing me $100 each, plus giving $50 to charity. So I am doing it for 25K. I, I went to State Kings. They decided to do it for me. No fees. And so you can, you, you put in, let's say you put in $100 for me. You didn't put in the, the markup. The $50 is going hope for depression. Uh, research foundation i've uh, suffered from uh, clinical depression for a number of years they do great work so i decide i'll do it for charity doesn't matter whether i win or lose the charity automatically gets twelve thousand five hundred from the markup and then all these people have a statistical 15 percent chance of getting their 100 dollars back i would say more realistically in the three to five percent chance yeah i'm trying to think about how much of a piece i want to get in here for what am i I'll, I'll take a little sweat i'll get in there for the sweat okay uh, yeah I appreciate it. If you get, yeah, it's, 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 again, obviously the, the charity is great. Uh, it's a small, you know, get, get for a small sweat you want is as, as little as a uh, 150 total with 50 going to the charity. Uh, it's, it's worth it. And plus, you know, I'm the fan favorite. The people want me to, I'm, I'm doing it the people versus the pros and I'm calling it the donkey caravan. Uh, we're the donkey caravan. We're going to go on in and we're going against all the great players. And the, the thing is when you play like $1,500 horse, Doug, you got you do have some you know, a lot of holding players who aren't doing anything that day. They'll just come in. They don't have to play the other games. So you know, I have a better chance. Twenty five k. You don't got people saying, "Ah, when you got to take a shot at twenty five k." They're really good mixed games players. They're much. Oh no, you know, that's not true. Because on my last podcast, someone that never plays poker at all said he's going to take a shot at twenty five k horse. So that's <laughs> so. I mean, just have to directly disagree. You, you forgot, Norman, how much yeah. cryptocurrency is up this year. You didn't. Oh, that's right. That's, that's, that's a great factor. That gives me a better chance because then they have money to play with. So wait, 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 uh, uh, um, my con, uh, my con, the icon's not going to take a shot. 25 K. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I like, yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I love Brian. So, uh, Oh, good. Actually, you have a chance against something like him. So I'm yeah. actually, I'm better than average in four of the games. And I stick at no, I stick at limit. Hold them. Well, where do you know, uh, Brian, Brian from met him at the world series of poker when he used to play full time early on. And he was, he was, you know, we went around looking for care, you know, looking for natural characters, guys who are smart or funny or had a great backstory. And, you know, he was he was one that I, you know, if, if he had stayed longer and done better, he would have, you know, we would have probably promoted him more and, and, and seen him more on camera because I, I liked, you know, just I liked the way he handled himself. He was more immature then. He's gotten much more mature since I think he had, you know, I think he has a kid or he, he got married. He lives somewhere in either Niger or Cabo and he's more responsible now and he's smart with whatever he's doing crypto wise. Yeah, he's um, why is the name escaping me? where he lives it starts with an a antigua oh he's, he's antigua. okay he's antigua yeah so yeah that's a pretty good life if you're in antigua uh so yeah i think he made some good Wait. decisions oh okay okay i see what you're saying yeah uh okay so you know what you can mark me out for 500 i'm in for 500 got i got some action okay i'll uh, Tonky, thank you very Tonky, much 
Donkey Caravan uh, is ready to roll. And also, not only am I going to take $500 worth of your action, I'm going to send you along with a... Share screen work in time, please. Share screen work in time. <laughs> it's not working in time. A free upswing poker course. Wow, the fans <laughs> go wild. You need to up your game. Get into the training and learn how to play mixed games by Jake Abdallah. Free upswing poker course to send you on your way and make me some money. <laughs> okay, is it Jake? I saw Ryan Fee there briefly with you. So it's, it's Jake. This is by Jacob Dollar. That's good. okay. So Jake, oh uh, wow, free free course. We got some rats, some studs, some stud eight. Uh, well, oh, I, eight. I, I would oh. love to start crushing the tables with uh, upswing poker mixed games uh, today, if possible. You got it. Send me your email. We'll get it going after here, and uh, we can we can both make some money. <laughs> oh, uh, that's a good one. There we go. I mean, it's so so natural, so smooth. <laughs> It's smoother than Phil Halmuth on his uh, heads up duels when he takes the uh, whatever it is the brain fuels. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm enjoying a great brain fuel right now. Ooh, I love the taste of this. I, I honestly, Phil Halmuth is just he's just too much, man. He's just absolutely too much. Uh, I I don't even know if I've said this story publicly or not, but I feel like it's probably fine to say this. But I remember doing a, an ESPN broadcast and we were in the back room and Phil's like. Um, it's okay if I promote the Aria out there, right? And they're like, Phil, we're at the Rio. Do not promote Aria. Do not promote Aria. And he's, it, he's like, I can just mention them, right? And they do not promote Aria. Phil, I'm ser Phil, I'm serious. Do not, do Phil, don't do this. And then we go out there, right? It's me, Phil, and one other guy. And we're all, we're, it's an ESPN broadcast. And I, so I'm excited. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, you know, we have like, people in our ears. This is big. Is that we're at the big time. And then we're, we're doing, we're talking about the final table. And then Helmy just right out of the gate goes, and uh, we see Ben Lamb here, who plays for millions of dollars dollars at Aria Hotel and Casino. And I'm just like, what? what are you we, I just sat there and watched, watched this Phil. Don't do this. Don't do this, Phil. Don't do this. And just blast away right out of the gate. Oh, my God. So All good. I can tell you is story checks out. Just, you're not lying about a single moment of that and i wasn't there because he's done that with us but we've had him in the booth and we tell him coming out of break we got to do this no i gotta i gotta make this one point about the last hand no no we got to go to a feature so you can't do it no 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 we got to go over the same as you used to come out of the break he interrupts lon he goes oh let me just say this about the last hand and he just it, this phil can't help himself he cannot help himself plus he's a great salesman he just fires and the thing is what are you going to do not invite phil Hummuth back you're going to invite phil Hummuth back so he just he just he just knows he can kind of get away with it, and he just does it anyway. It's it's great, man. <laughs> Phil's amazing. He's it's actually, I've, you know, I've grown closer with him over the years, and even though he's, you know, I've, I used to joke with him that I should kick back part of my salary because it makes it so easy. Uh, it makes the broadcast so much better, and he's so easy to make fun of. Personally, I guess got along with him great, and he's just he's fun to be around. Uh, if you know the rule that it's all about Phil all the time, but he's just, he's a sweetheart. His friends love him, and he's a different person away, away from the table than being the poker brat. What are your thoughts on the older generation of poker players on TV poker versus the newer one? And I guess I'm going to be more specific with cash games than tournaments. Obviously, when you get deep in tournaments, this applies too. But tournaments, you get such a grab bag. I don't think it matters quite as much. I'm, I'm talking about more the high six, high six poker cash game type type lineups. What are your thoughts on the new generation of players? Because obviously, the new generation of players actually have to be very good to come up um, through the stakes. Whereas the older generation, a lot of it was branding. They they were in the right place at the right time. They played very soft games, etc. And some of them are, are 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 good. But in general, the new guys they only got there by being good. The old guys got there in part because of their personality and stuff. And so I feel that the new generation is a lot more boring to watch. You have people that are just trying to think about frequencies, just trying to think about what I need to do here from a game theory standpoint. And I mean, for example, my game. My game is not that interesting to watch from just uh, am I doing wild, crazy stuff? I mean, maybe it is to some people because I play very aggressive and, and people like that. Uh, but I'm not, oh, I looked I looked deep into his soul and I, I knew he didn't have the goods. I'm not doing that shit. I'm just trying to hit 14% raise in the turn or whatever. So right. what, what are your thoughts on watching the new generation versus the old generation play poker? Yeah, obviously, from an from a entertainment standpoint and a viewing standpoint and being around them standpoint, the older generation I much prefer. There's no question that the newer generation is going to be better in every fundamental fashion. But what we forget about TV for a second, Doug, and, and the TV, you know, the TV pros who are, are sort of false pros. 
uh, they just became TV characters. They weren't necessarily the best players in the world, but they just became TV guys. Before TV, and there was none of this you know, technical manuals, there wasn't the internet, there weren't solvers, there weren't all this. You, you had to win at the game in a different way. Okay, so there, there was, again, there's no online, so there is more people skills, money management skills, uh, knowing to get in, when to get in and out of the game, making more reads. Uh, so it's a different game for the best players to have to win. They didn't have the same tools in front of them. Now, if they were given those same tools today, they may be as good as the all these younger guys who are just, un, you know, they, they flat out are better. They flat out have done the homework. They outworked, they outworked the older players. They understand, as you're talking about, all the ranges, all the odds, everything, everything possible. So they're better, but to watch them, there's 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 no there there. I'm sorry, because when you and when I play with them, you know, when when online was banned and some of them floated into the, the, the card rooms and they would come in with the hoodie, the the shades, and the headset, and like we didn't exist. And I'd go over and sometimes I'd pick up the the left part of their headset. And go, Hello, we're human beings next to you. They I didn't want to play with them because then that the social part of poker was over. You're playing with all these autotrons and there's no fun. If you want to take my money and we're having a good time, I'll come back. If you want to take my money and you're either going to be a dick about it or you're not even going to interact with us or you're better than us, well, sorry, you know, I'm just going to go to the movies instead. So the newer generation, I think, just hasn't figured out a way to be the, a better businessman at the, at, the, at the table, the business of poker. That's why I, I, mean, I always give – we've both had our problems, say, with, uh, let's say, someone like Daniel Negreanu for one reason or another. Daniel understood at an what? early age. He understood before he was 30 – that the cards were the least important, least important part of the, the game. That if he if he interacts with people, if he makes the game fun, they don't mind giving him his money. That it's a business, it's a business to him, and he's got to make sure that the table stays filled and everybody has a good time and they come back. A lot of the other poker players I play with, they're terrible to recreational players. They're incredibly rude to new time to, to newcomers and new timers, and you know they make you feel uncomfortable in a room. That's why a lot of women don't come into a card room over the years. They are made to feel uncomfortable. So I just think they need to learn social skills and business skills to become better overall. It's hard reading some of the stories that women have to go through in poker because I, I to be honest with you, I have so rarely even played with a woman in poker. Right. When I think about my games online, I, I, I can only think of one high stakes female player that I ever even played with. And I mean, of, of course, you don't know everyone's screen name, but you kind of do at, at the higher tier. And then when I played in the the live tournament high roller scene, there was almost no women. I mean, I've only played with a few women, you know, for for any kind of re real serious game, almost ever. I played with almost no women. But when I when I hear the stories that some of these women have to go through about what people do, it just it, it seems it just seems unreal that these stories can even happen to them the way that they're treated and and talked to. So. I mean, that, that's obviously part of the reason why we don't have a new woman in poker. I think there's a lot of reasons besides that. I think that society kind of views men as it's okay to make money sort of however as a man, right? As a man, you just make money and then pe people just think you're successful. But for women, I feel we kind of have more of a feeling in a society that they need to make their money in certain fields, not other fields. And gambling is sort of a not good field. And so I think that that kind of detracts from women going in, into poker as well. I think, I think there's a bunch of reasons sort of at play, but yeah, the way that, that people treat women at the table uh, is, a, but, is a big factor in, in them not feeling comfortable playing the game. But you just made me think of something else with women. And one other thing, po poker, by the way, in spite of itself is, is still very popular and it's still growing. And there are two areas that it can grow just exponentially in the smaller areas. I do believe that they need, they need to be smarter in terms of promoting games other than no limit hold them. For other people who, you know, just making the games more attractive for more people. If, if you know, if you know, they'll tell you that no limit hold them. Obviously, we we, we put what the people want out there. So we're we're going to put onto the shelves what they're going to buy. But Seven Eleven, for instance, the most popular things are like milk and bread, for instance, or milk, bread, and eggs. But people might want other things. So if you just sell milk, bread, and eggs, then other people might are not going to come in there in case you know if they want soda, if they want uh, a beef jerky, if they want a can of corn, you, you, you get other people to come in and also do that stuff. A poker room that only offers one game is not fulfilling its potential. The other games can become more popular. You, I know you want to. Yeah, but don't, don't don't you feel like it's like a burger? It's like a burger bar selling regular burgers, and then you're saying they need the vegan option. No. Yeah. Okay. You'll you'll get some new people. You bring in the vegan option, but how, what percentage of people are vegan? Isn't it kind of like that? It's not quite that. Like, I mean, by the way, your argument's decent. I just I, I read a great article, a great article, a great Q and A with McDonald's CEO, and McDonald's continues to do you know remarkably okay in changing times. And they asked him, "Why aren't you putting healthier things on the item?" Because we put on our menu what people are going to buy. 
we would have your your alfalfa sprout salad. We would have this and this if they're going to buy it. They still want burgers. They still want McNuggets. So that's part of your argument. But I'm telling you, if you if you come into a room and you all have, there's actually a chance for these other things to properly marketed and branded become more popular. And I know that once in a while, when I get a no limit player to come over to play a mixed game and he's, you know, you know, you can, you can play more hands, you know, you're just not folding all these two, you know, you can play four chords more often. You can play more hands with the other things. They enjoy it. So I do think that that's a growth area, but the bigger growth area, despite all the problems we have with why women don't come into the room, it is absolutely professional and business malfeasance that we don't market to one half of the population. Think how poker, popular poker is right now with us disenfranchising half of the world and they, they're able to play it's one of the few sports or games in which there's no gender barrier you don't have to be stronger bigger faster you can come in and play it so i just think it's unbelievable that we haven't marketed so the poker room has 15 percent women in it instead of three percent it's just it just i just that makes no sense to me so that's where we can grow a whole lot if we can figure out how to convince the other half of the population that poker is a decent pursuit just to push back on that a little bit, maybe there are just not that many women that are interested in poker. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's the current breakdown, but I can see the data on my YouTube content, how many men versus women watch it. And that's not really a aggressive environment towards women, unless I'm reviewing a girl's hand on, on YouTube, because some of those get pretty nasty in a hurry. And I almost hate to even review women playing hands on YouTube because I just know the kinds of comments that I'm going to see. And, and it's a very difficult situation, but putting that to the side, I mean, my videos are pretty friendly and, and, and I think most people, there's not really a gender, there shouldn't be a gender gap there, but yet still 97% of my audience is men. And that, so is it, is it potentially possible here that women are just simply not that interested in poker? It's possible, and I know there's obviously going to be some differences between the sexes, but I can't tell you in all different pursuits, one of the reasons people think, oh, women don't want to be engineers, uh, you know, or, you know, black people don't want to be CPAs. They have no role models. It's not that they don't, they're never introduced to it. If, 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 if a, a woman never sees an engineer, never sees, it never meets an engineer, never sees an engineer, a woman engineer on TV, never sees a famous engineer who's a female, they're less likely to, to engage in it. So we don't have enough women right now because we haven't brought enough in who provide the role model in which you say, oh, I can do that also. So I, I just think that there's, it's more than, it's oversimplified to say women just don't want to play poker as much as men do. Men probably do want to play poker more. There's something in our brains and the way we're, we're operated where we're not, you know, we want, we don't mind gambling and they're more protective of money. That all might be true, but we're still making a huge mistake and get not getting more women into the game because we could. Yeah. The, and it's possible that both are true. I mean, it, probably, I mean, it's probably that yeah. men are much more interested in poker on average than women, but we also could expand the game tremendously by making the, making it a, a much friendlier environment for women to play and sort of being more inviting to them and, and, and doing our best to make it a place that they want to be. What That sounds nice, but then what actual policy changes can rooms make or can we make as, as, a, as a group here to, to, to change that environment and to foster that change? Because I know it sounds great that we should be respectful and nice to women, and we should, obviously, but I just know that there are so many dicks playing poker that I can't control. How do we change this as sort of a, a community to, to, to make that environment better for women. Well, you bring up, okay, forget the, the card rooms themselves and the card room operators, us in the rooms. That's a big stumbling block. You know, there has to be a sensibility change in the community. You know, we need to be more reasonable. We need, you know, it's just, I mean, you know, even if you have built in biases where you, you have racial biases and ethnic biases and religious biases, you, you learn, you know, to control them or that they're wrong. And so you're not going to tell somebody, that you know of a different race, ethnic, ethnic background, or religion, you're not going to treat them worse. You're not supposed to treat them worse. Of course, you're not supposed to treat them worse. So we have to teach ourselves as poker players simply to be more respectful of everybody else, uh, of our neighbors, whether they, you know, they're young, old, new uh, to the game, or women. That's really, really hard to do. As far as the poker rooms, card rooms go, it's just like any other business. What, what do you do? You, you do promotions. I mean, what, what's happy hour about you, you? You cut the drinks in half for two hours. You do promotions to get more women in there, whatever it is, to introduce them to the game for the first time. Uh, you know, I, I don't run a card room and I don't think like a businessman, but you just find a way to get them in there and make them comfortable. And then they come back. If they like the experience, they'll come back. I say, here's what we do. We run a promotion. We can pick a big card room and it'll have a picture of you and say, Norman chat, single question mark, question mark. And then we'll just distribute that out there. The women will be flocking in. I, I, that's the future. 
Norman. That's what we need to do. You know, I, I, I mean, I went on my way to do this podcast today, and I didn't come on here for this type of. I mean, it took a while, to, and you did the early wife question, but I don't want that type of abuse on my my social history. And, and that's yeah. it. tank tops coming out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Daniel, you, you look good. I wish you would dress this way. You look so solid. Maybe, maybe you're inspiring me to to change my ways. Um, a coach at Upswing Poker, Freed Mulders, you made a comment when he made a final table, uh, and he wanted me to just let you know. He said, thank you, because a comment you made about his appearance was, quote, got to respect that mustache. And he just wanted me to make sure that <laughs> that, that got said here today. So. You, know, since, you know, I do, you know, I'm partial to people with mustaches, and uh, my mustache now takes, you know, I've told people I've had a, people have told me I've had a porn mash, uh, a 70s porn mustache stash for years. And my mustache obviously is deteriorating and it should be colored at this point. But yes, I appreciate him. And uh, yeah, mustache, I'm left-handed too. Left-handed people stick together. And those of us with mustaches have come back the last year or two. People seem to like mustaches more. I just have a mustache because I hate to shave. Definitely been a resurgence in the mustache department over the last few years. And luckily for you, maybe it's a porno stash, but nothing else says porno to me. So you should be good to go. Let's talk about let's talk about uh, sports betting a little bit here. So you have a sh- uh, I don't know if it's a show. It's at least clips here that you've done on YouTube and, and on Twitter. Gambling Mad with Norman Chad. You did at least at least last year. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your your gambling show? Are you rebooting it again this year? Yeah, it starts again next week. We, we just had one month off just now. So, yeah, I started the podcast last October or November. And, uh, it's, you know, my, my goal, again, it's the same thing as in poker, Doug, uh, and in poker, you know, I don't take it seriously in terms of the, the analytical part of it. I've been around sports betters my whole life and I've written an NFL picks column for 13 years. And that column started by me f- saying, I will flip a coin on every game and I'll beat the four handicappers that you all have hired. And I did. So I know that in sports betting that even with the increased, uh, analytics and everything there's very 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 few people out there who get it right more than half the time there are people out there who can beat it it's 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 a handful it's 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 less than five percent of the betting community so i what my idea is to to go the other way have fun with it and and gambling mad besides the fact that i'm talking about things other than gambling i'm going to talk about sports and culture and, and 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 things in general uh i'm gonna make jokes about the teams and the games and then give you a pick but the pick isn't going to be sold on because of I've run the numbers and all that. I'm doing picks for other reasons and I'm going to do just as well as you do. So I just want to make it more entertaining for the, for the person who's gambling. And I actually see it. My, my goal fear here is actually to have a, it's like the equivalent of uh, Jim Cramer's mad money on CNBC where I'm just sort of a madman of gambling. I'm just kind of rolling around, you know, a, a man. So you, want to be a, so you want to be a fraud basically is what you're saying. No, I'm just, I want to be a what? <laughs> It's a fraud. I, yeah, I heard that. Yes. <laughs> no. So I, what I would, you know, when I do it seriously, besides flipping a coin and I use a Ouija board, you know, and I use, I use the magic eight ball. I got a magic eight ball right here. And, uh, you know, I just do different things. I'll do it with my dog. I just make it more entertaining, but also give you information. But uh, gambling mad is the, the general premise is that everybody else gets it wrong half the time while giving you this boring, nerdy approach to the, you know, they don't match up well on the outside and they don't have the speed. I'm going to do just as poorly as they do, but I'm going to make it interesting for you. I like it. I like it. It seems, seems like a very entertaining uh, product that you're offering here. Do you have yeah, any picks so. for us? Do you have any picks? No, I, you know, I, again, I don't have any picks. Yeah. When I have picks, they're not serious. Uh, and, and by the way, by the way, I incredibly, I just been lucky. I am over 500 virtually every year that I do NFL, uh, against against the spread it's hard you know it's hard and it's hard to hit 55 percent of your picks when somebody hits 60 percent of the year that's phenomenal so yeah i've been pretty lucky with my picks when i do the picks but i don't think i'm better than anybody else and i never give you a super bowl pick this might be the most upsetting thing i've said today but someone did an article and they tracked phil helmuth's picks that every season he announces his oh uh, win season over unders and in the last six years he is roughly 13 and three i think there was a tie in there maybe 13 two and one or 12 three and one i don't know um, either way, if you had been going with the Phil Helmuth picks, you would be completely crushing it, rolling in money. And if you had sort of doubled down on betting on him to win heads up matches, you'd be even more filthy rich. Does this guy lose anything or is he just a natural born winner? Okay. <laughs> positivity. Hashtag positivity. Phil, I will take Phil's action in sports betting from today to for the rest of our lives. I will take any, I will randomly take anybody's action in sports betting and I will not even, I will give them the VIG. They don't even have to lay the 10% because most people, the public is usually wrong. So most people are going to be wrong. There's no way you can win with the VIG, but most people are going to be wrong more than 50% of the time. So I'll take my chance against 100 randoms 
And I, I guarantee you that 70 of them are going to be handing me over money at the end of the, any period of time. But we're not talking about a random. We're talking about the one and only Phil Helmuth. Did you know, by the way, he's actually won the most World Series of Poker bracelets of any human being? Did you know that? <laughs> it's been mentioned to me. And he's also, you can't believe how much he's up in the big cash games, uh, especially his home cash game. And he's up in the high rollers. And he's up to, you know, he's got some bet now about he's got to play all these high rollers and be in the black. No, Phil has sometimes exaggerated or misremembered some of his past, I believe. Uh, that's just, just a feeling of mine. Uh, occasionally I, I'll have guests sort of do that. And I, I I've had, people, well, why don't you call people up if they, if they misremember something? I, I just feel as the host to just nitpick and say, actually, you got a second over here. It just feels, I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't have guests on the, to nitpick them. You know, right. I, I want to hear what they have to say and, and people can c- kind of do their own, their own, um, take their own inferences away from what, what the guests do have to say. Now, if someone says something particularly egregious, I'll, I'll have to step in and, and and correct the record but you know sometimes you just got to let people say that they won the last 25 out of 26 matches or whatever i I, i'm not even sure that he he was wrong on that but just the way that he worded it it seemed really aggressive so i just kind of took a step back um what did you did you watch some of the the heads up if you watch any of the heads up stuff in the last year you watch any of my my challenge yeah i watched some of your challenge uh actually what i did because i i couldn't believe that this challenge was you know the 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 original super bowl which was not called the Super Bowl uh, the first year, uh, you know, whatever it was in Super Bowl one. That was a big was the AFL NFL championship game. It was such a big, big deal. That was covered by two networks. Both CBS and NBC did their own play by play. And that's when networks were something. You know, there's only three networks then, there's no cable. It still stunned me that the Doug Dean Eggs challenge had three live streams competing for it every single day. It just was shocking to me. So I would bounce around to the three live streams, you know, for no more than 15 minutes each. So I'd watch every day, maybe an hour. And some days I didn't watch it at all just to see what they were doing, how many viewers they had, what their approaches was. But it just was beyond, you know, the, when we had the man on the moon, that's a big deal. You want every network watching the man on the moon, but we're all live streaming. We have the, you know, we have the, the, the official upswing live stream. We have the official Kremlin task, Pravda, Daniel Negreanu live stream. And then we had uh, Joey's who, which is the best. I'm sorry. Joe's was the best. So uh, yeah, I, I watched a lot of your uh, a lot of your your live uh, business. I would have wish in the if you did it again and it was online. I wish we could see you all talking to each other. It would make it would be fifty times better to have you both you know on the screen like you would when you're doing you know when you're doing your own Twitch TV or live stream thing. So you both could talk to each other makes it a lot better. It's it's tough to talk in hands though, especially when you're thinking a lot. And I don't want to be giving away a lot of tells because you start giving away tells, Norman. Before you know it, you're jamming the nuts with Queen Ten on Jack Nine Eight, and then the other guy just folds Ten Seven, and it's just because it's, it's you have no one to blame but yourself. That's an interesting example that you would bring up. Uh, I don't even know where you would find that from. That sounds like it's made up though. Hypothetical. It was just hypothetical. Thinking, yeah, okay. maybe maybe something. That yeah, would you yeah. seriously? Would you? Uh, uh, if again, you're playing two tables at once, weren't you? Two days, uh, yeah. yeah. So playing two tables heads up uh, would have been a big drawback for you to do what I just talked about, where you're both on screen and and like can talk if you want to talk. Well, it's tough because then it becomes I have to be doing the same thing every hand no matter what because I don't want to give away tells pre flop or on the flop or with my facial expressions. So really, what you're doing is you're making it so that because when you play in a live ring table, most of the time you're not in a hand. Right. So you can chit chat and, and right. goof around or whatever. And that's kind of the, the spots you're thinking the whole let's just chit chat while I'm in a hand thing. I mean, I, I, I the stakes were already pretty high. I had a bunch of side bets on me. I had to win. And not to mention the, the devastation to my career and legacy. If I had lost that, I you smile. But I mean, we all no, know, know. It was, we all know it was on the table. If I lost that, if I lost that, yeah. it would have been. It would have been everything I had done in my career. You could just chuck that out there. Yes. Oh yeah, Doug lost to Dina yes. in that heads up challenge. I thought it was supposed to be good. That would be the end of the story. So that I would have been to tough win. for you. It would have been tough for you financially and emotionally. And there's no question. I mean, and your example is great because the old thing it takes like 15 years to grow a tree and just 15 minutes to chop it down. Everything you had done up to that point, you had more at stake that way. If you had lost that challenge to Dina, yeah, you'd be that'd be hanging on you for quite a while. So I'm not going to be too chit chatty on online. I mean, we played live a little bit and we chit chat, but then once a hand gets serious, you kind of just have to shut the fuck up because if you're if you're really if if you're giving away any information, it can be used against you, you know. Well, anyway, so some of us, you know, I was actually uh, 
you know, I usually don't root for anybody in these things and uh, we're not close to each other. You know, you know, we have a mutual respect and, and disrespect, uh, but it's most mutual respect, but you know, I was forced to root for you during the uh, majority of that. I'm match. sorry, man. Brutal. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, so I, I I will say um, part of it is it's a little bit surreal because as a kid, you know, I would listen to the world series of poker stuff and um, you know, he hear your voice and it, I really loved what, what what the work that you did, and then to actually get to hang out and talk with you and stuff. It's uh, I don't know. There, there's a few things that I guess you sort of realize that you, you're a part of kind of like the the world now. The you're part of the the poker world, and and getting to, to talk to you and, and hear what you have to say, and even just chit chatting with you on Twitter and stuff, it makes me kind of kind of gives me that flashback back to being a kid. And you know, I, I appreciate the coming on the podcast today, and also you're fucking funny, man. You have some you have some good bits. You yeah, have some well, bad you have some bad bits too, but you have that question. Have, Good no, man. you can't. You know, it's 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 almost like the Amir Vahidi line he did in the, the World Series poker the first year, and, and No Limit Hold. He says, and and you know, to to to, to be what to to be if to be willing to live to if you want to live in a tournament if you want to live you got to be willing to die. Uh, when you're doing what I do, there's going to be home runs and strikeouts, and I'm willing to take the swings and just hope that my batting average is high enough that the stuff is you know when it's good people enjoy it, and when it's bad they forgive me. And so that's the same thing with my column. There's a lot of jokes in my column. I just hope enough of them work where they say that, you know, I'm doing it good enough, so I'll do it again next week. I, I think that, honestly, we're not that different, you and I. I mean, I do the same thing on YouTube, except I have an editor that makes them look way less bad. So I, he kind of, you know, fixes things up, makes it makes it clean, and then my, my jokes that – and also th this great thing that he does that it's a uh, – I'm talking about Thomas Keeling, my, my editor, yeah. Seriously Serious. One thing he does, and this actually – is maybe the most important thing he does no one even knows he does is the jokes he cuts because when i send him all of my jokes or when i send him an episode i give him full if you think something needs to be cut you just cut that and and he doesn't even let me know he just cuts it right out and so I'll be, oh what happened to that bit he'll, he'll just be like, yeah we decided against going with that one <laughs> so, that's great you give him that much authority and trust but that's to his that's a compliment both to you and to him so and he is terrific, and I've always noticed early on with your with your videos, I couldn't believe how well produced they were, and and all the bells and whistles. And I said, wow, you know, they, you know, he's not even, he doesn't even have a TV background, and it's amazing how good they look and sound. So uh, it's actually given me a goal that when I start to do it from home or something, that I got to make it look and sound that good. Yeah, I mean, I, I can only just really give him credit for that. Obviously, he's helped me with all all that kind of stuff. I, I will say it's funny looking at stuff I did when I first started getting into content five six years ago. And just listening to myself, oh, it's brutal. It's just brutal looking. Why am I talking like this when I? What are you doing, Doug? Stop talking! I want to just like shake my six-year-old self into, into not sounding like that. But I guess you always cringe, kind of especially hard when you when you look back at your stuff. Do you ever look back on some of your shows and that you've done in the past, and you think, oh God, what was I doing there? Or, or do you like? Yeah, I do. Because in the, in the old days when it re-aired a lot. To get, you know, we we don't do it most of the year. So to, when we're about to go back to the World Series and go into production, I kind of forget what we did. So I will go on to ESPN and find, you know, five or six shows that re-aired and watch them to get me back in the mood to see what we did just sort of from a clinical standpoint. What was I doing and what do we do with the flop and all this? But when I watch them, I see things that, you know, same thing with your right. You go back and you, you look at something you wrote a year ago or five years ago, 10 years ago, and you, you cringe at certain sentences. I cringe at certain things I say that I want to take back. I cringe at mistakes early on because they, they want me to do a little more strategy than I wanted to do, obviously, early on. I cringe when I'm saying early on for anybody listening to it, when I'm talking about anything that has anything to do with their hand. You know, oh, he went all in on a draw? How can I go all in on a draw? I never go all in on a draw. And they called me tournament, tournament player Norman Chad. I mean, what's that all about? You'll never see me do that. Did I just break the bottle of wine? But yeah, so I cringe when I do that stuff. And I cringe when I you know, have certain bits that don't work. But you just take the bad with the good. Have to take your lumps. One thing I've noticed that you're really talented with is your command of, of the English language and your, your word selection. And I think when you write, you have a, you have a, a nice style. And when you tell, when you tell a joke... I. You have a really good command of language. What, what, how did you develop that skill set? There's a lot of reading. I mean, I assume it's a lot of writing. What, what kind of has given you that, that ability? Well, uh, I mean, being more complimented than I am as a writer, I'm a decent writer, but I, I literally use like the same 250, 300 words over and over again. And most of them are single syllable, but uh, well, for me, that's impressive. So just tell me more. <laughs> so what I, you know, when I used to have to, you know, I've, I've had to lecture at journalism classes once in a while, guest lecture and stuff. And I tell them it's the same thing I would tell a poker announcer. 
Uh, there's not that many poker announcers, but most of them are going to be poker players. That when you're writing, you know, you know, if you're just you're going to be writing about sports, let's say you're going to be writing about the Baltimore Ravens, you know, why should I know about uh, pop culture? Why should I know about U.S. history? Why should I know about uh, literature? There's certain, you know, it's like when a cook, a cook might going to use two or three spices in that rack for a particular meal, but sooner or later they're going to have to use this other one. So every once in a while, you'll find the perfect spot where, oh, that, oh yeah, let me let me use some let me use some rosemary on this one. So as a writer or a broadcaster. The more knowledge you have outside of your particular area gives you, first of all, gives you a better perspective. It's healthier. It's, it's stupid to narrow in on just, this is the only thing you think about. But it gives you the opportunity to bring some of that into your writing, into your announcing that's relevant or can be entertaining. So that's why I used to tell them that you, you've got to be, it's, it makes sense to be well-read. It makes sense to have a well-rounded education, even if it's just informal. So I used to tell people, you know, you know when I went to the University of Maryland, Doug, it wasn't very good. And I knew I could have gotten a better education if I literally read a hundred books a year for five years, you know, read two books a week in all sorts of areas. If you just read 500 books and there's one university that still does it, they, they do the greats at St. John's university in Annapolis. If you just read 500 books for five years between the ages of 18 and 22, that's a pretty good education. And it'll, it'll help you with everything that you do in life. So that's, you know, if I, you know, if I find the right word or find the right thing to do right here and there, it's because I got the spices in my rack. And so you've got to have the spices in your rack. I think I need a few more spices in my rack. Honestly, I think I think I need a, a couple of more. This year, I, I've made a big focus on picking my words more carefully and not saying the ums and the likes and yeah. the the stuttering stuff. It slowed down my speech a bit, and I think that it makes me a little bit more pointed with what I say. But my uh, verbiage could be could use some some improvement, and maybe maybe it's time to pick up some books and start reading. Books are just so boring, though. Oh man. Well, now you can obviously you can you can listen to them or I know nobody reads books anymore and no one certainly reads the print version of books in general. But just one other thing with with poker players become broadcasters. And this this is thing that bothers me. And you, you've done it differently because actually you've worked really hard. Most poker, almost every poker player that we have come in as a commentator just sits down in front of the mic and starts talking and obviously going to do mostly analysis. And they think they've done a good job. And some of them are better than others. And some of them are terrific, like like Nick Schulman. You know, he's, the voice is great. He's and the best, I think. He's just tremendous yeah. to listen to. In general, I would tell them, you know, you know, I tell them there's so much more to, that's going on here that you don't realize. And they go, no, what, what are you talking about? So first of all, if you're a poker player, how'd you become so good? You know, you became good. For, you might have natural instincts for poker, but you played a lot of hands. You talked poker with other people. You studied, you know, the, the various stuff that you do, that you see the training manuals. There's a lot of things that keep up your game. So, you know, you're disrespecting what, let's say, a, a broadcaster does when you just walk in and start to talk. There's so many other things that I'm doing before I come into the broadcast booth that you'll never do, whether it's preparation, whether it's, it's thinking about certain things I'm going to talk about, writing down big picture issues, talking to the players, researching the players, thinking about the storyline while we're going through instead of just hand for hand. What's the big story today? All this stuff you all don't ever consider. And you all walk, you know, you walk away and you wave to the crowd. And, you know, why do we have Norman doing it? Well, because it's, it's the reason you have professional broadcasters doing it. It's because they do these other things. So, you, you know, you would disrespect a poker player who just came in and started to do whatever they did. And you could tell that they didn't know what they're doing. You could tell they're picking the wrong spots. You can tell they're, they're three betting in the wrong thing. You tell they're raising the, the, the wrong bet size because you know the game. Well, I know broadcasting, so I'm not going to have guys walk in here and just start talking. So, oh, yeah, you're the, you're the best ever. You know, you're next to Howard Cassell. You're the next Walter Cronkite. They're not. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no, you know, if you don't put the time in, you can't be really, really good. So I tell them, yeah, you, you, some of you do a good job, but how good can you be when you don't put the time in? There's always this balancing act too of natural ability versus how hard people work to get good at things. And I said this about my own game, my poker game, which is, I don't think I'm a natural talent by any stretch of the imagination. I just simply outworked people. I was willing to put in as many hours as it took to beat people heads up because that's what my life was. It was make sure I won heads up and I beat everybody. And so when it comes to things like, broadcast well i guess content creation is a little bit different but uh I, I i treat it very much in the same way i treat it as a science let's look at the data and youtube has cool analytical tools where you can see oh when i do this and that people don't like it or when i do this people tend to leave and, and you start to kind of hone your craft a little bit while also trying to to remain genuine and sort of true to yourself i think there's there's always a balancing act there but there's little things you can do to fine tune stuff all the time so i, I have notes every podcast i do now because i found i have someone on and then they'd say something and then i'd want to i'd want to respond to one thing but then they talk about something else and then i would be thinking about that and then i wouldn't remember the thing before so now when right. people when i have guests on and we're talking i take notes just to, just this 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 so then when they 
finish, I can kind of choose what I think is the best thing to respond to talk about. And and that's helped me a bunch. And, I, and there's all kinds of little things I'm sure that you can do to, to help yourself improve and, and, and get better at the craft, right? What are some things that you learned along the way to, to, to be better at your job? No, but you, but you still, you're pointing out to me that you have done the work. You know, you're, you're almost like the little brother I never wanted, but you know, I would be proud of. Cause I know watching your videos over the years without knowing you that these, you know, these things don't look good just cause you walk in and you start talking into a mic. You have to plan them. You have actually, you have a good production team. You have Thomas, but that's, those are all the things that go in. And even I would tell, you know, I, I love Jamie uh, when I'm working with Jamie Kerstetter. And if, if I was, if, if I was her poker broadcasting coach, I would tell her, as I tell everybody else that even when you're just analyzing a hand, there's a way in which you structure what you're saying that make, that makes it easier for the viewer. You have to think about, uh, the way that you, the, 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 that you present the information and you make it clear and then you actually like sort of sum it up at the end. So it's just not, you're just not responding and reacting to what you see, but you make a point and there's a way that you can make that point better if you think about it. And so if you go back, if she goes back or anybody goes back and watches what they're saying, they can see what I'm talking about and that they can actually then connect hands and you can, again, it's better for the viewer if you go, oh, this is, you know, this guy's doing a lot of three betting today. We saw him bully seat two before. We saw him bully seat three, four. So you, besides going hand by hand and figuring out a better way in which you describe that hand and make it as easy to understand, you then have to look at the bigger picture and put the uh, connect the dots together so that it gives, again, it gives the viewer more bang for their buck so they can see what the trend is at the table. So it's just a lot of things to think about rather than just analyzing each hand as it comes along. Well, you're telling a story and you want to make sure that you tell the story from start to finish in a way that makes sense that people can can have things to take away from it. And I think with the hand analysis video specifically, I don't really do those anymore, but I've done a lot of them. You want to make sure that there are little things that people can take and sort of put into their game. And now they're a bit better. And and with that series, I did poker hands where I would analyze that it was. It was tough because you want to make sure that you say advanced enough things to where advanced players would look at and say, oh, this is pretty accurate, but not so advanced that noobs would get lost and confused. And at the end, and by the end of it, I had done plenty of both. Plenty of great right. players said that I would butcher spots all the time and then, you know, bad players would be confused what was happening. But, you know, you're always going to have to try and, and be happy with, with some degree of middle ground. But, yeah, I mean, I I, I worked hard at, at this, at the, the content game to 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 build an audience and and improve and kind of be open at, to, to critiquing myself and improving myself and i think poker is actually good at that and this is good it's a good skill set just in life but poker is really good at teaching you that when you're bad at something you're bad at it because you lose and you lose money and the, the guys that are not honest about the fact that they're bad they just lose consistent consistently until they either quit or they have to admit it or they just lose indefinitely and, and they never come to that realization but for me, oh, I lost. What happened? How can I fix this? How can I improve myself? And it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't attack your self worth to do that. To, to be honest right. with yourself and try and critique yourself. And and I actually think that one thing that I do too much of, we're getting a little therapy here on the podcast. I feel like you're my therapist, Norman. I'm laying it all on the table. But I critique myself too hard in everything that I do because I I hold myself to to a really high bar. And I think that that hurts me it's great for your career it's great for heads of no limit you want to be the best you need that you want to be okay with your diet today not good you want to be happy with what hobbies you had picked out for the afternoon not good you want to you pick up the guitar oh man i should really know more there are other things that's not good at right so balancing that and not trying to be a perfectionist and other things is something that uh i definitely struggle with and, and try to try to i've tried to, to to let go a little bit lately well you're still you're 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 uh character flaw there is in the right direction though. And you just mentioned with poker players uh, who lose poker players as a subset are some of the least self-aware people I've ever met. Like just, just be even, even beyond poker, but in their poker, you know, I go to the commerce and every other person's walking around like they're Johnny Chan and obviously they're not. So poker players have a lack of self-awareness and combined with that, that they're always have, they're very, you know, very, their, their interest, whatever's happening in the poker room, always all they think about is their self-interest. So the lack of self-awareness and the fact that their self-interest comes first makes it difficult to deal with some poker players in any type of situation uh, in the poker room. They're never wrong and they want what's best for them. And sometimes you got to do what's best for the community. So, <clears throat> but you, you know, and one of the things since they're not self-aware, they're not working hard enough at their game to get better. And they're, they're lying to themselves about the losing. I have, I have people who I told them to start keeping a ledger of their wins and losses and that hardly anybody wants to. And they'll do it for a while. And then, but no, they start to do, first of all, they start to lose, they quit. And then I had one friend of mine 
who started, he told me, well, you know, I'm putting inflated figures in my book. I said, G -g 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 Steve, you're defeating the purpose of what you're doing. What you're, you're putting higher wins when you win and smaller losses. when Yeah, I don't want to look at big losses. Well, just give up the ledger. I mean, the ledger is to keep yourself honest, see what you're doing. But yeah, so poker players generally, you know, they don't keep uh, an honest ledger in their life. The ledger is such a great example. I have given that piece of advice to so many starting poker players. What should I do? Track your results accurately. And then without fail, six months later, they hit me up or I check it or whatever happens. And then, oh, how's it going? What, what, what are your results like? Oh, well, I'm not sure. I think it was, well, what about the, the results you were tracking? Oh, you know, I in, insert excuse, right? <laughs> it's always. If, if, if you you want to take, if you want to be a professional at something, take it seriously like a professional would. You're not just going to hop in, be amazing, and, and not even know where you're at. Get honest results so you can at least track and know where you're at, right? You, you need that. Otherwise, what do you have? You just have what you remember. And humans are notoriously bad at remembering accurately uh, data in, in large sets. We remember those individual moments. Oh, I remember that time that I got sucked out on. Everyone's got their bad beat story, right? But what about the times you sucked out on people? Or just You just need the data. You need, you need to be able to analyze the data. And that's a really important part to improving at poker. You remind me because we do have selective memory. <clears throat> and when my first wife was leaving and she was saying this, 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 I said, come on, Jody, Jody, Jody. You know, you're, you're, all you do is you're remembering the bad moments. You're not remembering. This is the old bad beat, good thing. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're forgetting all the good times. Let me. Let me tell you. That you remember. Remember when we had the lobster. We had the lobster in Baltimore. But yeah, she. I, my argument to her because I didn't want her to leave is you, you got selective memory. You're just remembering the bad beats. And she told me without using the term bad beats. Yeah, but all this stuff kind of piles up. Like you know, like when I married you, you told me you were a murderer, and I thought that's not so bad. But then we have 15, 20, 25 bodies in the in the hallway. I never thought you murdered that many people in the smell. So she left. I didn't blame her. Well, earlier you did say everyone has skeletons in their closet. I just didn't realize that yours were literal. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, that, I think that kind of brings us to the end of this. I'm going to get out of here while I can get out alive. Um, is there anything else? Uh, is there is there anything you're up to lately, Norman, that you want people to follow you uh, follow you on? Any, anything you want to plug? Anything you're, you want to promote? No, I don't. I usually don't promote. You know, I'm at Norman Chat on Twitter. Uh, uh, Gambling Mad when the podcast comes back starting next week. Uh, you know, you can find it on you know all the usual podcast places: Apple, Google, iTunes, whatever. And uh, I think you, you know, Gambling Mad moves quickly. It's just a thirty or forty minute show. I move around to a lot of different topics. Uh, I do odd crimes. I do. I, mean, I just do a lot of stuff. And it's if you don't like one thing, you can move on to the next thing. Because every two or three minutes, I'm moving on to something else. Uh, which is what I prefer. I know there's the other format like this one. Like I can never listen to a three and a half hour Joe Rogan podcast, even though some of the interviews are terrific. Uh, I just like something that, you know, on a 30 minute drive, I could pop into the, into the, my, uh, whatever on the car and just listen to it while I'm stuck in traffic. So you're talking shit about my podcast format while you're on my podcast. That's very nice of you. I appreciate you taking the time to stop by today. Okay. I didn't talk shit about your podcast. I just said the longer what form is not for me. Okay. All right. That's I fine. I've been water maybe. here. I've been losing my voice the last fifteen minutes. Maybe, and maybe I, some, maybe some people enjoy the longer format. They do, maybe, but maybe I do they like I that. Do you've turned, you've turned the corner or a new leaf on this. That's really a nice jacket and shirt. So, and you know, my first girlfriend told me when you look better, you feel better. And maybe she was right because she told me I wasn't dressing well enough, and I I couldn't dress well enough. But she says if you dress real nice, you feel better about yourself. That's true for some people. Uh, it's certainly not true for me. And I know most poker players just want to come in in a t-shirt and blue jeans. Here's the problem, though. I am horribly sweaty, and there is very bad oh, things happening. Yeah. Very, very bad things happening under this jacket right now, <laughs> and 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 it's it's extremely uncomfortable. And I'm damp. I'm okay. damp as I as I sit here talking. So okay. it's a turn off. I'm just down. You know, when they used to play the Larry Flint home game in his home, the seven start stud game, where everyone would play because Larry certain medical ailments, he would have the the thermostat at like fifty five or sixty. You had to come there and and just wear heavy clothes to, 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 you know, to win a rack or two. So he turned the thermostat way down because of whatever his medical condition is. I'm telling you, if you're sweating under those clothes for two hours to blow the air out at 60 degrees, I sweat at the world series of poker, man. Okay. Well, that's why every time I pass you, you're wearing, you're wearing your basketball Jersey or whatever. I, I you just, I, I need to be comfortable for extended periods of time. I, I run hot. I run hot. <laughs> are you? Are you? Yeah, I know you run hot. Are you playing I run any, hot at the Rio? <laughs> are you? Are you playing any events at the Rio this year? Uh, I'm debating a, a short trip. Uh, I'm getting married in November, and so oh, really, oh I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah I didn't even know you were dating. No, I knew you found you had a relationship. I'm, that's great. You're getting married in yep. November. 
Yeah, I've been with Kaylin for nine years and I'm getting married in November. So cool. we are going to be doing that and then honeymoon and stuff. So I'm going to be missing um, the main event for sure. But I, I'm debating maybe a, a weekend trip, head down, play a couple events. I heard that 25K horse is going to have some pretty soft players in it. Maybe I could get in there and, you know, catch the dead money. Uh, yeah. So let me just back you for $500 and then uh, we'll be. Oh, we're swapping. We're swapping. Uh, is that... No, we're not swapping. You're contributing to my thing. Sorry. Okay, but thank Not you for swap. contributing. Thank you for contributing. I'm in. I'll let Get, you know. Shit me the details. I'm in 500. Let's let's get this donkey caravan on the road. All right. Thank you for remembering the donkey caravan. <laughs> All right. So that's going to do it here for us at the Doug Polk Podcast. Appreciate you guys tuning in. If you have not yet, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss excellent guests like we had today. We have our next podcast coming up two weeks from now. Alexander Botez will be joining us on the 14th. Tentative right now. We're still working out some scheduling stuff, but we'll be back then. Maybe we'll throw something in next week. Schedule's a bit of a flux. Either way, thank you for tuning in today, guys. See you again soon.